Um, before we get started, I have a couple of logistics. Um, first, can everyone hear me? If you can't hear me, um, send us a chat message, please, and we'll try to figure out what's going on. But we're unmuted on this end at this moment, so hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, hopefully you'll also be able to see me. We may not be able to see you, but that's fine. Um, as long as you can see uh, the person who's, who's speaking or presenting, um, that's great. Um, we'll have everyone except our presenters muted during the entire um, session. Um, if you have a question, please send it via chat. If the presenter has time following her or his presentation, um, she may be able to answer your question. Otherwise, we hope to um, address questions during the afternoon conversation session. Um, if anyone has a question um, about anything, if, if you have a problem with your um, hardware, um, try, to tr try to troubleshoot it on your end first, and then if that's not working, um, just send us a chat and we'll see if it's a problem on our end. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Claire Booth Loose Program's Room for Wisdom convening. Um, for 30 years, the Claire Booth Loose Program has sought to encourage women to enter, study, graduate, and teach in science, mathematics, and engineering. 2019 is the 30th anniversary. To date, the program has supported more than 2,500 women at nearly 200 institutions. In recognition of the program's 30th anniversary, we highlight as what as we highlight what we see as a critical but generally under-addressed aspect of the study and teaching of science, that's ethics and STEM. Claire Buchlu's professors are leaders and innovators, conducting groundbreaking research and educating future scientists. How are these high-achieving women balancing the potential benefit of their scientific research and discoveries against the potential, real or perceived, to do harm? How are they educating the next generation of scientists to recognize this capacity for light and shadow. In their work, um, what role, if any, do students have, um, or do students see themselves as having in the discussion of ethics in STEM? Is there a responsibility on the part of higher education, um, of the higher education sector, to ensure that wisdom is imparted along with scientific knowledge? If so, whose responsibility is it? What are some Claire Booth Luce grant recipient institutions doing to ensure that both STEM students and faculty recognize the responsibility that comes with the power of their science? Who is doing work to actively counter or mitigate the impact of technologies that may have already contributed to societal inequities? For example, bias in artificial intelligence. Finally, what ways are Claire Booth program participants individuals and institutions finding, finding to communicate STEM ethics to the public. Today, the Henry Luce Foundation is hosting this small convening of ethicists and faculty representatives, as well as a number of guests um, from select Claire Booth Luce grantee institutions. The goal <coughs> of the will be to launch our year-long conversation on STEM ethics. After today, our conversation will continue with the Room for Wisdom blog which will be hosted on the foundation's website and which will take a deeper, uh, which will take deeper focused dives into issues of STEM, of ethics in STEM. Again, drawing on the collective wisdom of the Claire Booth Luce program community. We will invite guest bloggers to submit posts that address one or more of the questions that I just shared or topics generated by the convening or other issues that they've identified. At the end of the year, the foundation will compile select blog posts into the Room for Wisdom book. Um, now I'd like to just uh, have everyone do their introductions. I will need to share Michael Gilligan, um, president of the Loose Foundation's regrets. His flight, unfortunately, was canceled last night, the flight that he was to take back to New York City. Um, so he won't be able to join us for the convening today. He does share his, regret, his regrets. Um, I'd like to ask our presenters to introduce themselves um, in the order of the agenda. So I'm not sure if our um, presenter. Okay, great. So that so Maggie Little, I hope that you can hear me. Could you please? I can. Look? Yes. Wonderful. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, everyone. It's so wonderful to join everybody this morning on such an important and inspiring topic. 
My name is Maggie Little. I'm at Georgetown University. I'm a professor of philosophy here, but I'm also founder and director of something called Ethics Lab, which joins ethicists trained in deep theory together with design thinkers to innovate on how we teach and ethics into um, the curriculum, including STEM. And amongst our interests in particular, uh, we teach flagship classes and we also have a program of uh, uh, developing creative ways to bring workshops and, and learning experiences into uh, non-ethics classes. And just two months ago, we were awarded a grant from the Mozilla Foundation um, to join a national working group on this topic and also uh, to fund our work uh, to use our methods to infuse ethics across Georgetown's uh, computer science curriculum. So inside of courses, across the arc of the course, and across the arc of the major. So I'll be excited to share that with you today. Wonderful. Thank you, Maggie. John? John Lucker? Yeah, okay, wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Lucker. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. I am also responsible for our leadership programming and I uh, for graduate grants. Today I'll be talking about uh, our flagship ethics and leadership program for graduate students called Okay, I think we lost you towards the end. I'm going to ask everyone else um, if you're not a presenter who's going to be introducing yourself shortly, please make sure that you're muted. Um, I think we can hear some other conversations going on in the background. Okay, so our next um, presenter who will introduce herself is Deborah Matthews. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Deborah Matthews. I'm at the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. Uh, I will be talking this morning about a number of our training opportunities at the intersection of STEM and ethics. Um, and I direct here, at, I'm an assistant director at the Berman Institute of um, Science Programs. So I work on issues at the intersection of emerging technology, ethics, and governance. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Deborah. Our next presenter who will be introducing himself is Alan Fine. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I apologize. I have a little bit of a cold. Um, my name is Alan Fine, and um, actually, I'm a physician. I do, still do basic research, and I'm director of the Responsible Conduct of Research Program at BU, and I'm going to spend a little time talking about this program, its contents, and its challenges. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to introduce our colleagues who are California-based. It's a little early for them to be on this morning. They'll be joining us this afternoon. Um, Eric Tillman, PhD, is department chair and Fletcher Jones professor, Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Santa Clara University in California. In 2015, um, Dr. Tillman joined the Santa Clara University faculty from Bucknell University. Um, he was appointed as the Fletcher Jones Endowed Professor uh, in Santa Clara after spending 13 years on the East Coast. He has served as the Chair of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry since September 2016. And he will discuss the impact of loose funding on teaching and scholarship at Santa Clara. He will sh uh, share a time slot with his colleague, Don Heider, who is the CEO of the Marcola Center for Applied Ethics the John Courtney Murray and SJ University Professor of Social Ethics at Santa Clara. Don Heider is the Chief Executive of the Marcula Center for Applied Ethics with full responsibility for vision, strategy, fundraising, and leadership. In addition to his role as the Executive Director, he serves um, as the uh, uh, endowed professor that I just mentioned, and he will focus on the ethics component of teaching and scholarship at Santa Clara. I'm also going to introduce our colleague from um, the University of Detroit, Mercy, who will be um, presenting this afternoon. 
Um, Alexa Rihanna Abdallah, PhD, is Professor of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering, again at the University of Detroit Mercy. Um, she um, let's see, received a BS in Electrical Engineering from um, Ecole Superior de Engineer de Beirut um, and the University of St. Joseph, um, a master's and a PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Michigan. Her research interests include water and soil remediation, in particular contaminant faint path fate pathways and remediation design for surface and groundwater polluted with metals or chlorinated compounds, as well as energy sustainability and clean technology. So I would just like to ask our colleagues who are here um, to, um, to go ahead and please introduce themselves before we can continue with the um, presentations. Um, actually, I think maybe Rachel, if you could introduce yourself, please. So my name is Rachel Fink. I'm a long, long, long time professor at Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts. I'm a biologist. Um, I've never been trained as an ethicist, but the day that Dolly the Sheep was announced and I saw that headline, I go full tilt into uh, trying to put those pieces of the world together. And I'm here today to talk about a program that I do where I have my upper level small seminar course give a bioethics panel debate to my 150 student intro class. So it's bringing freshmen and seniors together We've traveled to Washington to go to Presidential Council of Bioethics. We've done all kinds of things, and I want to talk about that. Really exciting. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Hi. My name is Joan Bellow. Um, a former um, Claire Boot Bruce um, student scholar at St. John's University, and now I'm currently a professor at the university, um, associate professor and chair of the Division of Computer Science, um, Math and Science. And I'm here to uh, talk about um, how we incorporate the ethics component into the computer science uh, freshman level courses with a service learning project that also deals with um, cybersecurity issues and cyberbullying um, as well in terms of in terms of that and how we have courses at our programs that are geared towards um, ethical computing. So students take specific courses um, that are cyber law and ethics and a couple other things as well. We had a camp that was funded last year um, through the <coughs> students at the camp, a major component was about ethics in computer science, and um, I'm here to talk about that, so you'll hear more about that from me later on. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I'm Gina Florio, Associate Professor of Chemistry and Physics, also at St. John's University, um, <coughs> and I am going to tell you about some individual kinds of things that, um, that, that I'm doing in my course-based undergraduate research experience um, with second-year undergraduate students um, around um, responsible conduct of research. And um, my other hat that I wear at St. John's is uh, institutional effectiveness assessment um, and, um, and strategic planning. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the more institutional, you know, di divisional, departmental, and institutional change um, that we're hoping to see. We're, it seems like we've got, you know, some good um, building blocks and we need to some institutional transformation kind of work. Um, we shared a copy of these bios um, with everyone via Zoom. So you should have access to that document as well as the program agenda. If you don't have a copy of the final agenda, <coughs> access those via Zoom. Let us know if you don't have those, if you're, if you're not able to access them, and we can make sure that you get them not during the meeting, after the, after the meeting. Also, uh, we have been joined by our brand new Claire Booth Loose Program Assistant. Some of you um, have already received chat messages from her. Um, Sarah, if you wanna take just a, um, a moment to introduce yourself. Sure, hi, uh, my name is Sarah DiMartazzi. I am the new Program Assistant here at the Claire Booth Loose uh, Program. I am three days old in the organization, <laughs> and so this is my, my crash course in uh, technology, if you have a question, feel free to reach out to me. I will be monitoring the chat throughout uh, the presentation today. Great, thank you, Sarah. 
And we're also joined here um, in, uh, in our conference room by a couple of our Loose Foundation colleagues. I don't know if they want to introduce themselves, just say hello. Sure. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Ray Di Pasquale. I'm the IT director of the foundation. My name is Iris Shi. I'm the communications manager here at the foundation, and I'm hoping to pick up a few tidbits from your presentations that we can share with our, our followers and uh, all of our Clever Clues alumni. Great. Thank you so much. All right, wonderful. We actually seem to be a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, so that might actually be good for questions in terms of the question um, standpoint. So uh, Maggie, if you're ready, I think I'll go ahead and ask you to um, go ahead and get started, please. Wonderful. Um, so I can begin by saying a bit about um, our ethics lab and at Georgetown about the importance of having ethics training in STEM, especially uh, with the digital revolution that's changing everything about our society, our economy, how we communicate with each other, and our political uh, institutions. So, uh, like many others, we're convinced that the digital revolution brings extraordinary promise. Artificial intelligence and machine learning can change um, how we respond to refugee crises, the climate change crisis uh, can help in the battle to cure diseases. But the digital revolution and engineering also bring uh, real potential for uh, uh, peril, often through unintended consequences, where people who are, um, in one sense, understandably excited about the potential <coughs> technology, uh, sometimes are running so fast that they outstrip the sort of normative frameworks that society would want to develop around the use of the technology, but also sort of professional standards for what makes somebody um, sort of the responsible use of, of, of that technology and, and those who build it. So uh, this year, Georgetown established a tech and society initiative that's across the entire university, med campus, law campus, and main campus. And as part of that, our, our group ethics lab, which I'll be speaking about more uh, in detail, has really taken um, seriously the need to integrate ethics into everyone on the campus, every learner from undergrad to master's to PhD, who is going to be out leading in the digital space, uh, especially uh, in where we're starting is with our computer science majors. Um, so uh, we have a deep belief that the students we send out um, from computer science and other data analytics and um, informatics uh, programs are going to need and, and maybe more importantly really deserve scaffolding and, and understanding of the ethical issues that they're going to confront. Um, one of the convictions, I guess I'll speak for myself, uh, as I gone back and forth, for instance, to Silicon Valley often and talked to leaders there and, um, and soldiers in, in the engineering fields. Uh, the amount of what, what we as philosophers would call moral distress in the industry is really high. Um, one of my favorite questions to ask people who are in the industry, and um, again, whether it's machine learning, artificial intelligence, data collection, uh, synthetic data, is uh, what they are most scared of at three in the morning from what they're doing. And it, you just have to ask that question and they can't stop talking. So I'm sure there's some self-selection there because the people who would come and talk to an ethicist are not the people who are going to be rapacious about their technology. They are the people who, are, who actually care and are, are trying to build a better world. But they're doing it often with, uh, without language, concepts, and frameworks to even inform the, the lens through which they're seeing their technology. So our goal is really to um, integrate ethics into uh, the study of STEM and doing it in a way that's integrated in, a, in as native a way as we can to the syllabus learning goals, um, adventures of the classes that they find themselves in. So while we do offer flagship classes in, um, at, at, in Ethics Lab in data ethics, um, including lots of issues around algorithmic bias, um, also social media and divided democracy. Uh, 
uh, um, while we do offer flagship classes and it's really important <laughs> to do that, we also uh, feel a really strong conviction that um, uh, and a, a, a really strong approach to ethics in STEM is one that integrates it internal to the curriculum of STEM. And I just want to say a couple words about why we why are we so passionate about that belief. Not again, not that you shouldn't have some you know, three credit full course uh, deep, uh, hopefully interdisciplinary ethics classes in this. But if if students only hear about ethics in their ethics class, however cool that class is, and however much you bring in engineers and the like into that class, which we do, if ethics is never mentioned internal to their major. It's never mentioned by the professors who are teaching uh, how to code and do software development. Uh, in their class on what makes a good algorithm only ever talks about, for instance, the efficiency and com computational ability of an algorithm and doesn't talk about the social justice implications, right, and make that an integrated part of metrics for a good algorithm. And, and not only are we losing the opportunity to make to, to help support an ethical lens for these people, but but we worry it can actually unteach ethics because it can foster cynicism. So again, if only the ethicists are ever talking ethics and their their computer science faculty, I'm just using that as an example, um, are the people to mention ethics? It, it's really problematic. And my my other fellow colleagues in bioethics, for instance, know know those lessons from you know medical ethics education. If you only have a, a guest lecture or a uh, one class on medical ethics and the people teaching the rest of the classes never talk in ethical ways, it sends a pretty loud message about what really matters in the field that they're going into. So we're very excited um, to have, as I mentioned, uh, gotten a grant uh, from the Mozilla Foundation who um, uh, is, is very dedicated to making a difference in this space and put out a challenge grant to universities and colleges around the country um, for proposals on innovative ways of doing ethics in, in um, computer science in particular. And Ethics Lab was chosen as one of 17 awardees. We'll form a working group with folks um, and, and share out um, with, ev with everybody, with the world, um, the things that we think worked. Um, in our case, uh, the, the, the project we'll be doing is based on our uh, experience with a program we have at Ethics Lab that's called Engaging Ethics Initiative. And it's the part of what we do that it really is um, the piece that's about infusing ethics into non-ethics courses. And what we do that's a little bit different from some places, um, there are lots of good models, it's, this is just uh, the one that we're working on, is we work with the faculty who are interested in uh, bringing out the ethical issues that they see in their courses. And we co-design um, active exercises uh, that have philosophy embedded in them, philosophical ethics embedded in them, but not at the level of theory or coming in and giving a lecture, but just regarding philosophical <laughs> ethics as offering some really productive tools certain concepts and distinctions and questions and ways of thinking that are kind of consensus understood to be a, to be tempting but a problem or incredibly aspirational because we think ethics can be part of the sort of design aspiration of tech as opposed to just the guardrails and the police keeping you from blowing up the world. So we work with those professors and their syllabi and their learning go goals and co-design um, with with our uh, design thinking faculty. So uh, some of you know about design thinking. These are folks who often are trained in the design fields like architecture, graphic design, but are pulling out of those design fields certain practices and habits of minds and ways of thinking and learning that really add things like um, visual thinking, uh, um, uh, prototyping ideas, uh, tabletop exercises and facilitated discussion that go fast and collaboratively that set up the circumstances then for a really meaningful facilitated ethical conversation. So I can share later um, through the foundation some examples of the sorts of things we do, but they include adapting tools from design like empathy maps and 
journey mapping and we have an exercise called mapping the moral landscape and i really do want you to imagine like tables with butcher block uh, not butcher block but but butcher paper uh, spread out over that lots of post-it notes fast time boxed exercises that do not start with theory but start with putting you right inside a um, a scenario and asking you to start thinking about quickly um, what what you're worried about what you think who are the stakeholders and then using that as a way of sort of activating all of our muscles our empathy muscles as well as our analytic muscles we then again facilitate group conversations and with very specific prompts and 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 the goals are to lead the students to surface the ethical issues as they see them instead of our telling them what the ethical issues are but then having surfaced them in that again sort of a more authentic native way we because we have the philosopher and the designer and the computer science person right there and we've all planned this out ahead of time we can then deepen the conversation by giving some of those tools both from the the philosopher and the computer scientists who can talk um about again the one example of you know what makes a good algorithm and how we have metrics for um uh, uh, uh predictably biased data and ways in which um data analytics can then amplify the bias that's inherent in the data and how we can do better and there are good practices out there so the goal of all of it is minimally to let students add to their lens uh, a sense when they go and, and see the, the world they're they're trying to build to be able to spot ethical issues and not be neutral and just think because we're good people everything we do must be okay which is a very um not infrequent piece of the culture in in certain tech industries um, but also to see ethics as aspirational that it's wonderful to build a better world and ethics can help you do that even better by naming values that you're trying to achieve by getting creative about your know, progressive pathways ethics can help untangle problems and not again just tell you what not to do though it's also important to have that understanding as well so um we're very excited. Uh, we're working with the computer science uh, department here at Georgetown, and with the Mozilla grant, we'll be, um, as I mentioned, really working to do these infusions very intentionally for the entirety of the computer science major. So this is the last thing I'll say that going back to what I was saying about, we really want to emphasize the importance of, of integration. Um, uh, as many people, you know, uh, will also be trying to do. And so here what we're trying to do is, again, have touchstones that are intentionally ethical <clears throat> across the semester in three key moments of currently four classes that are key to the major. So an introductory one, a middle level one, and a capstone one. And then the goal is after we do that once and, and uh, test, at, uh, uh, we can iterate and expand so that the entirety of the computer science major here is a model for how always to have tech conversations um, interwoven with what do we want to use it to do to build a better world. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, I will definitely be reaching out to you later about those tools that you mentioned that you might be willing to share with us. Um, we really appreciate your particip participation today. Um, I recognize that you aren't going to be able to stay with us for the rest of the um, of the convening, but you're welcome to stay for as long as you can. And um, I certainly enjoyed hearing more about the work that you do at uh, Georgetown and with the Ethics Lab. And I'm certain that everyone else um, who's participating uh, enjoyed it as well. So thank you very much. You're so welcome. And I'm so sorry I couldn't be there for the full day. Um, it's a, it's a, but I was so glad to at least be able to share this with all of you. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, and we completely understand that all of our presenters are extremely busy people. And uh, we just really appreciate everyone taking the amount of time that they can take today to join us for this important conversation. So thank you again. <laughs> okay, so John, if you're ready. I am. Um, so, the, uh, so 
Uh, my name is John Lipker. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the Graduate School of Notre Dame. Um, I was tenured and promoted through the Texas A&M system, and I got here in 2011. Throughout that time, I've switched roles. Or my responsibilities have switched a little bit, but over the past few years, I oversaw our professional development programming, which is uh, about over 100 workshops a year for our graduate students and postdocs in teaching research. Ethics of the year. Uh, over the last year, I've shifted to really focus on leadership and ethics. Not that I wasn't doing it before, but uh, we recently hired a program director for ethics, and he did most of our partnerships on ethics, why I do a lot of the leadership training. So, the goal of my talk today, I wanted to discuss two National Science Foundation funded programmings. It led us to the creation of our flagship ethical leadership training program for our graduates, students, and postdocs at Notre Dame. It's called Leadership Advancing Socially Engaged Research, LASER as an acronym. I'll talk about why we chose that acronym as I get farther. So the current research shows that the cultivation of ethical workplace cultures is dependent upon leadership, and our programming really builds from that foundation. Uh, and despite the importance that leadership is in fostering ethical cultures, most of our ethics training in STEM typically conveys that content through passive learning methods rather than really trying to attempt to create ethical leaders through experiential learning and feedback. That takes more time and it takes more effort. Um, and also it tends to be through smaller group learning. And a lot of times uh, we have a compliance focus about our ethics training especially through the Responsible Conduct Research Training Network. Therefore, many scientists and engineers who take on leadership positions during their careers master their disciplinary knowledge as graduate students, but not the requisite skills in leadership and ethics. Therefore, we believe that more focused and active leadership training is needed at the graduate student level to create more ethical culture in our STEM discipline. And we here at Notre Dame strongly believe that ethical leadership training is both important and effective for PhD students. One, because they have greater independence and decision-making responsibilities afforded to them compared to undergraduates. Second, we think the outcomes of the decisions made have lower stakes uh, than when they move on to the next stage of their career, whether it's a postdoc or an assistant professor or in industry. And that learning from failure is okay, and we can create an environment for PhD students to take risks, but then also be supported by their advisors. And then thirdly, students have access to multiple mentors in multiple roles here um, in the academy as PhD students. So we should provide them with those mentors and those experiences. Um, we also strongly believe that, and it is supported by the literature that training programs in ethics and leadership are most effective in cultivating ethical cultures when delivered as hybrid experiences. So students learn about training to work through role playing and hands on experience. And we have two Notre Dame programs that use this model as a foundation. So in 2014 and 2015, we were awarded two NSF grants. One grant was the EESE grant, the Edu Ethics, Education, and Science and Engineering grant. The other was the CCE STEM grant, which is uh, Cultivating Cultures for Ethical STEM. These two awards were over 700,000 in funding. And they supported the two programs, which were cohort-based, 12 months long, and for 16 students in each program who were between their second and fourth year in their PhD STEM program. The first program uh, is the Social Responsibilities of Researchers program, or SRR for short. It was housed in our Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values, and it focused on the social and ethical impacts of STEM research. The main goal of the training was to help students recognize and engage with these issues and ethical impacts. Content covered philosophical ethics, case studies, science communication, policy, public speaking, and more. Uh, students then undertook a project that engaged in the social context of their research. And I'll talk a little bit more about these projects in a second. 
The second program was the Ethical Leaders in STEM program, or EL STEM for short. It was housed here in the graduate school and I was the facilitator for this program. It focused on building leadership qualities and insights in the students that participated. Things we did were focused on communication skills, values clarification, emotional intelligence, crucial conversations. Uh, really looking at self-awareness in the context of leadership in STEM. And then also students engaged with leadership practicum where they applied what they were learning in a real world context, sort of parallel to the SRR program. So both programs were about 80 hours of face-to-face -face interaction uh, throughout a calendar year from uh, summer to the next summer. Both programs, uh, looking at participation between men and women, it was about 75% female uh, and 25% male. One thing I do want to focus on is the project-based learning. So there was 102 different projects uh, proposed and then participated in by uh, these students. And that's really where they applied what they were learning in real time throughout the program. Examples of this were female or diversity empowerment in STEM. So there was a STEM mentorship program established by two students. And currently they have 120 undergraduate students, in, female students in STEM, being mentored by over 60 female graduate students in STEM disciplines as well. Uh, another project was distilling academic topics for public enrichment. Uh, there is a student who, looked, who is giving talks at the public library about how to navigate social media uh, with all the misinformation that's out there. Uh, we have also a science policy initiative and a common good initiative that students were involved in. But it's a, pro it's a project that's generated by the student and then supported by the, by the participation in the program and the other students in the program. Uh, both programs emphasize ethics, but they do in very different ways. Uh, the goal is applying what they're learning in those particular contexts uh, that they find themselves in and using learning to make an impact. SRR took sort of the explicit and fairly standard philosophical ethics pedagogy approach in emphasizing the ethical stakes of research for stakeholders. While EL STEM takes a more implicit approach that includes ethics in the course of leadership training and decision making focused on self understanding. And uh, throughout the experience, students were look, they were hoping to improve on four broad sets of skills. Leadership and decision making, values and ethics, communication skills, and the knowledge of relevant non science social content. And the goal of these two programs were to assess their effectiveness, but then combine them uh, at the end of the grant period, which was three years. So we had three cohorts of each program into a, into a single model that could be sustained at the university. So we assessed them pre test. So before they started the program, at the conclusion of the program, and then a year out from their conclusion of the program, we looked at moral judgment, self-efficacy, integrity and character, and then six shared program goals of LSPR, one being context, two being <coughs> feedback, three being engagement, four being adaptation, five being self-awareness, and six being model, modeling and mentoring. And through our assessment of the three cohorts at each of the three time periods, there was significant positive impact on all six shared program goals, and then a positive impact on participants' moral judgment, self-efficacy, and integrity. The other benefits we found through uh, feedback sessions and qualitative, qualitative assessment uh, one was just being surrounded by a diverse community of peers. So being able to have a cross-disciplinary discussion of ethical issues and also just to support each other um, in ways, or also to find support from others in ways they couldn't find in their lab. Uh, they appreciated being able to run workshops on their own, giving them some self-confidence standing in front of a classroom. Also, they found growth and self-awareness uh, to be important ethical discernment, and also career discernment, trying to, 
trying to see how what they're learning really gelled with what they thought their career aspirations were going to be. And then that experiential learning was important as well. So we took what we found and we put it into one program which we called LASER, like I mentioned before. It's a unique co-curricular program that focuses on leadership and social engagement for graduate students. And now it's open to all disciplines. Um, so what we're seeing is more diversity in, in the group, and I think we all are benefiting from that. Leadership is all about context, and the context we use in this program is being a socially engaged researcher. And the reason we like to call, the reason we decided on laser was that really we're trying to assist these students finding both direction and coherence in their own work. So the first four months we focus on self-awareness, and we could consider that some level of leadership development. The next four months, we focus on social engagement and social responsibilities, which then becomes the context of their leadership development in that space. And then we spend the final four months tying it all together. This is no, in no way a finishing school for these types of uh, experiences. This is a foundational experience where students then uh, spend a few years with us. That's why we chose third and fourth, or second, third, and fourth year students, so they could really have an impact on the community before they left. So, in summary, uh, you know, how can someone be expected to be an ethical leader without real-world, tangible experiences to learn from? And that's really what we're trying to give these students. PhD students spend a lot of time in class, in the classroom, and in their labs, but with little training on how to lead in these environments. So the implementation of this experience helps bring students out of these sometimes restrictive environments and apply their knowledge in both at the academy and industry. Future leadership and ethics training programs should consider building upon a model like this where students properly, where they're properly equipped to deal with leadership and ethics, not only in theory, but in practice. And finally, we need, to, we need more experiences like these if we're going to do good in this world and compliance training and checking the box is not enough. And so I'm really excited to hear about other, other universities that are doing things uh, outside of sort of this check the box mentality. Um, and so, thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I really appreciated hearing about your um, two NSF programs and also how you um, now combine them into the single laser program, which is open to all disciplines. It really does sound like a fantastic foundational experience. And um, I will personally reach out to you uh, later to see if we can get some more information from you about that, that maybe we can share with the larger uh, community, if you don't mind. Sure, I, I can give you the website information and anything else that would help. Great, thank you so much, John. All right, um, so our next pre presenter will be Deborah Matthews from Johns Hopkins. Deborah. Yes, good morning. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak at today's convening. I uh, am a human geneticist by training who does work in ethics, so this intersection is particularly um, near and dear to my heart. I'm going to talk about three sort of very different um, kinds of training that we are doing here at Hopkins at this intersection of STEM and ethics, starting with a uh, sort of very broad reach experience that is a, a MOOC, a massive open online course that I developed that's available on Coursera. Then a very large course for undergrads that we have here at Hopkins. And then lastly, a very small targeted program um, that we have just launched designed to enhance diversity in ethics research around genetics and genomics. So the first, the MOOC, it is called Engineering Life, SynBio, Bioethics, and Public Policy. Uh, it was launched in February of 2017, and it's targeted at, at basic scientists working in synthetic biology. Basic scientists, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, who don't touch human subjects, 
don't have many opportunities to really engage with the ethics and governance issues raised by their work. Uh, and I have been for years now uh, part of a very large synthetic biology project that is creating a yeast with an entirely synthetic genome. And this uh, MOOC, this Coursera course, was sort of came out of a gap that we identified as part of that work in terms of giving our scientists an opportunity to really think about, learn how to identify, engage with some of these issues. Uh, it's funded, it was funded both by uh, internal Hopkins education grant and as part of a lar larger NSF grant um, that funded the synthetic biology work. The, it's a five-week course. It's composed of readings, lectures by me, and uh, filmed interviews that I did with experts in the field, uh, including, and I'm sorry, I think Maggie has had to leave, but Leroy Walters, who is at Georgetown, um, and Jane Calvert and Deborah Scott, who are both at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, synthetic biology, of course, is a really broad area of science that merges engineering and biology, and it has lots of different applications. And so while most of my work focuses on applications of emerging technology to human health, uh, this course is much broader. I actually start with the, the emergence of recombinant DNA technology and the history of that in the 1970s um, with Asilomar um, and the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee. Uh, then in week two, we talk about gain of function research, so research where you're giving organisms uh, capacities they didn't have previously. Uh, for example, you know, a virus that transmits better uh, between humans or between animals and humans. Week three is on biofuels, which is a very different kind of application of this technology. Uh, week four is then on human health, which is really, as I mentioned, my wheelhouse. And then week five on governance. Uh, and so far, uh, the course website has had over 12,000 visitors. Um, we've had about 2,200 people enroll in the course, uh, which is many more than I could actually reach here at Hopkins. Although, despite the fact that it's the biggest reach, it's also the impact of that is really difficult to measure. These are people that are in, I think, something like 20 countries all over the world. Uh, and so assessing how people are actually using that knowledge uh, in their daily lives is is a bit more difficult than more personal on the ground kinds of education. The second uh, activity that I want to tell you about is a course we design. I designed here at Hopkins with two of my colleagues from engineering, um, Phelan McGowan in biomedical engineering, and Israel Ganat in um, electrical and computer engineering. And this was this course was launched in the fall of 2016. It's a hybrid online in person and in person course. And it was it's targeted to undergrads at Hopkins, primarily in the Whiting School of Engineering and um, the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. And this came from uh, was developed with funding from a an internal call for proposals on practical ethics. So ethics um, in STEM beyond by but beyond the traditional bioethics that the Berman Institute does. And this course, uh, our grand vision for this course was to scale it up so that all undergrads at Hopkins could take it. It's broken into two modules. The first module is eight weeks, and uh, the second module in four weeks. So they both modules fit into one undergraduate semester. The um, eight-week module one is a combination of readings, online lectures, and online discussions through Piazza. 
where the students are identified as themselves and are asked to respond to prompts and are required to respond to each other um, over the course of the week discussion. And we found it actually leads to a really robust conversation in which students are able to bring in links and other readings and really engage with, with each other in a way that would be difficult in a large in-person class. Uh, we cover the focus of the courses on practical dis, practical ethics and decision making. So we expect that our students are going off into the world to be leaders in their various fields and we want to give them the tools to identify what an ethical issue when it's facing them and then give them tools to figure out how to make a decision about that. Right? You the that's the the tricky bit. You have an ethical issue where you have two meaningful goals and or um, fundamental uh, commitments in tension with each other, but ultimately you have to make a decision about what to do. And we want our students to be able to do that. So we give them an introduction to ethical theories. We talk about frameworks for decision making, including recognizing the issues and stakeholder analysis. Uh, we talk about empathy, decision making pitfalls, and thinking about creative solutions to problems. We go through codes of ethics and key questions you need to ask yourself about your decision-making process to make sure that you've sort of taken everything um, into account. We talk about decision-making in organizations, and then we talk about global and cultural differences. And throughout this, we have students doing, you know, um, an automated trolley problem kind of exercise, uh, implicit bias exercises, uh, and we're collecting data on what the students are saying and then sharing it back to them in weekly discussion, discussion sessions. Module two, we actually send the students off into self-organized groups. Well, we assign them to groups, but then they're required to meet. We give them a case and they have to meet together at least three times, do whatever background reading um, and research they need to do to think through the case we've given them. So the first year it was the release of genetically modified mosquitoes. They have to figure out what the issues are. They have to figure out what the decision who gets to make the decision that has to be made, like whether we should release this, these mosquitoes in this jurisdiction or not. And then they have to embody that stakeholder and make the decision. And then they have to um, write up their decision process and justify their decision for us. Uh, and the first year, I mean, well, every year it happens, but uh, the students will come back, they are completely certain that they have all made the right decision and then they, we share with them what all the group's decisions were, and they are completely convinced they did it right and everyone's decision is different. <laughs> um, so over, we, like I said, this was launched in 2016. The first time we ran this course, we had 17 students. The second year, we had over 80. The third year, we had over 120. And for this coming fall, we currently have capped out at 172 students with about 30 on the waiting list. So it's been a very interesting process scaling this up. Uh, these students over the years have come from over 30 different majors. Again, primarily in engineering and arts and sciences, but also in the business school and elsewhere. And then finally, the third uh, program that I want to talk to you about is one that we have just launched. Um, it is our Genomics and Society Mentorship Program. This was funded by a grant from the NIH, NHGRI, um, and the LC program, the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications program. And it is focused on enhancing diversity in LC research, again, ethical, legal, and social implications research. We launched, uh, our students showed up last week. So they have just arrived at Hopkins, our first cohort. They are five students from, that among them have seven different majors. So a very um, interesting and eclectic group of, 
of students uh, from three different universities. Uh, part of this program, in part of this program, we uh, partnered with three local universities, Morgan State University here in Baltimore City, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which is just outside of Baltimore, and Howard University in Washington, DC, to help us identify students and um, get them to apply to this program. This program starts with a 10-week um, intensive summer research internship during which they also get uh, coursework in the Berman Institute spring intensives. So see right now they are downstairs in basics of bioethics. They'll be in that um, all week in the mornings and in the afternoons they'll be in um, an ethics of US and international human subjects research course. We will, I'll have them every Monday for a genomics and society seminar that will alternate between sort of historical cases in ELSI, uh, potentially like Dolly, which who was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, and contemporary literature that the students are particularly interested in given the projects they'll be working on. We'll also have um, bi-weekly professional development sessions for our students. Uh, four of the five of them are actually pre-med, so uh, we'll make sure that they that we talk about stuff that's relevant to them, um, as well as sort of general professional development, like how to survive in an academic institution. Um, and then there's a lot of mentoring that happens. So I am one of their mentors. They have a research mentor, so the person, the PI that they're working with on their 10-week research project. And then we're also matching them with a student who's either a, a master's in bioethics student here at Berman, a PhD student, or a postdoc to provide additional um, mentoring at a different stage in career. At the end of the summer, they'll all participate in a research symposium at which they'll present the research that they did during the summer. And then I'm, we're going to continue our relationship with them when they go back to their institutions this fall. Uh, we'll have quarterly calls as a cohort, and then we'll also uh, co-mentor them to with a faculty member back at their home institution to put on an event, uh, an outreach event at their home institution related to their interests in genomics and society. And then we'll bring them all back next summer for one week to sort of re reconnect them to their networks here at Hopkins and introduce them to the next cohort of students. So this, of course, is a very different kind of activity than either of the others. Uh, it's also the newest, so I don't have a sense of impact as yet, but I'm really excited to have these students here with us at Hopkins this summer, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Deborah, for sharing um, uh, some information about the outstanding programs that you've got going on at Hopkins. And I'm really interested in the MOOC myself. Um, I've taken a number of Coursera courses. I'm a lifelong learner. And um, is your course still available? On it is. It is, great. It is. Well, you might see me sign up for it. <laughs> <laughs> I encourage any of our participants to consider um, signing up for it and, and having their students take a look at it as well. Thank you so much again for sharing all of that information. Yep, and, thank you for um, the opportunity. I, I will, it's our pleasure, um, and I will definitely be in touch um, following um, today's uh, activities. So thank you again. Great. Okay, so um, we're gonna go ahead and ask Alan to join us. Alan, you may need to unmute yourself. Yes, I, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, so good morning again, and I apologize. I have a little bit of a upper respiratory infection. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm the director of the responsibility, the Responsible Conduct of Research Program at Boston University, the RCR program. And I thought it might be useful for you to sh for me to share um, uh, uh, some of the features of this program, its contents, goals, and some of the challenges that we have. Um, and um, I thought it would also be useful just to go over the history a little bit of RCR in general and uh, some background to just to give it, put a context on what I'm about to talk about. So um, 
In the early 1990s, in, in response to a very high profile case of research misconduct, um, with a very that involved a very prominent uh, biologist, the NIH decided that um, grant recipients, particularly those that uh, received certain kinds of grants, grants that were directed at uh, trainees or at early faculty, uh, must undergo research training, uh, research ethics training. And um, at that time, they, uh, there was really no data on how to do this. And to be perfectly frank, there still isn't really good data on what's the most effective way of teaching research ethics. But the NIH uh, issued a mandate that there should be um, a program, universities who receive NIH money should have a program um, that involves case-based learning, at least eight hours total, uh, with two, uh, four two-hour workshops, and they should be thematically based. And these themes include uh, objectivity in science, collaborative research, publication, in particular, uh, the responsibilities of authorship, peer review, and data integrity. Um, although they didn't really provide additional details on what they wanted, it was up to the universities to come up uh, with programs that incorporated this mandate. Um, and then in a two th about 2007, the NSF said, you know what, um, our recipients should also undergo research ethics training. And they basically said it's completely up to the universities to figure out um, what kind of training that should be. And at BU, it was, the decision was made to really lump both groups together um, and have the same program. So um, what we have uh, is a program in which um, uh, students who meet the, these, these criteria that they either receive these kinds of grants or junior faculty who receive these kinds of grants or, or students who are supported by the NSF must enter uh, the RCR program. And this includes an introduction uh, that's on the internet that goes over very broad principles of research ethics. And then they must uh, sign up for four two-hour workshops that are uh, thematically based. And this is really the centerpiece of our program. Um, and it's a case-based program uh, that's run three times a year. Um, each year we graduate on both campuses. We have two campuses here, and I'll talk about that. That's a little bit of the challenge of the program. Approximately 200 or 250 trainees per year. Now, um, we try to be uh, we, we try to be realistic about this program. We're meeting with students or trainees a total of really eight hours in their five year career as a PhD student or shorter, and we try to be very practical in what we can achieve. But at the same time, we hope to be aspirational as well. Um, but again, we hope that our aspirations are infused by a, a degree of realism. So in terms of being practical, you know, we, um, we feel that there are certain just basic facts that trainees have to know um, uh, about um, uh, research and research ethics. For example, they have to know things about plagiarism, what constitutes plagiarism, what is self-plagiarism means. They have to know things about data integrity, how data has to be stored, how long one is required to store data, and then certain elements that are particular for human-based research, we also emphasize. But at the same time, we try to be aspirational. Um, again, trying to be very realistic about what's, what we can achieve in just eight hours with these students. So what we try to do is we hope that we can uh, instill a certain ethical mindfulness uh, and that we can um, allow or or help students sort of develop a certain sensibility to some of these key issues. And that we always emphasize uh, how important it is um, for students for all of their, in all of their um, uh, careers as researchers, how critical it is to be uh, fully transparent uh, in everything that they do, that there's a, a a realistic recognition that human error occurs, um, how important it is for them to sort of take control of their careers, to have, uh, be proactive in their uh, dealings with their mentors, uh, to have 
prophylactic conversations ahead of time so they understand the local cultures that they're residents in, what constitutes authorship in those cultures, and that also how, how important it is for them to manage two really key parts of their research and training careers. That is, when they enter a, a new research environment, there are certain very important things that they have to know, particularly with regard to data storage, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and also how to manage leaving a research environment. Um, what's gonna happen to your relationship to your mentor? Uh, what's gonna happen to the data? What's gonna happen to the project, future publications? To be proactive and to assert control over their careers. We also emphasize to them that many things in ethics, there aren't clear-cut answers, and that a lot of what one does and thinks is based on their own personal values. But at the same time, we do emphasize that each of them has a, has, a, has a, their social responsibility, and then what they do matters. And we give examples where little small things that you, one does in the laboratory really matters. Grants may come out of it, important papers that may lead to uh, human studies come out of it, that it's really, really important. Everything you do matters. Now, threaded through this, uh, we try to also emphasize the fact that the proper ethical conduct of research has impact on research reproducibility, which obviously is a very key issue nowadays. And the way we do that in part is by asking them to think about um, how they deal with outliers, um, uh, issues with regard to selection of data for publication, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how these, ses these sessions are structured, that um, they're large groups, they're about 50 to 60 students, and they're, uh, they are in, uh, there's a large group of students, but they're in small groups that are random, and uh, of about, about eight students, and it's, comprised of heterogene with heterogeneous backgrounds, people from engineering, from the School of Management, from the School of Medicine, et cetera, et cetera. And they're given cases to discuss um, that relate to the overall theme of the workshop with uh, prompts. Um, and then uh, they have a discussion. We found we have faculty mentors there that help facilitate discussions. And we underscore, or we emphasize to the to the faculty mentors how critical it is for them to share their own personal experiences um, that are relevant to the topic of the cases. <coughs> we also have included um, real-time polling using cell phones, which is kind of fun and uh, helps facilitate discussion and admittedly at the same time gets the students to use their cell phones for other purpose, for the appropriate purposes. Um, but we, you know, we have uh, significant challenges. One is, is that this is clearly a have to um, that the students must do. Uh, there are no grades, so there isn't really much of a stick. It's a very heterogeneous population. And um, we have this ongoing uh, tension between uh, uh, this program being a, a, a compliance issue uh, and then at the same time, we want to be very effective from a very teaching standpoint. So we are always mindful and concerned about this being a checkbox. Um, the way we've responded to this in part is to make the cases very relevant and practical, but at the same time infused by some of these aspirational goals. Uh, we have conducted surveys and we uh, serve food. Um, the other thing is that uh, in terms of this tension, I think in contrast to a lot of RCR programs around the country, it's run out of the uh, grad, the uh, provost's office or for graduate affairs as opposed to the compliance office. And I think that really has helped make sure that in part this doesn't become just a checkbox. The other thing I, uh, I, I thought I would do is that I would just broadly just summarize a couple of the cases just to give you a flavor of of um, uh, of what uh, of the nature of the cases and what we hope uh, the students to get out of them. So one, so there's here's a case. Uh, one case is of a, a young woman 
who uh, has been working very hard at figuring out uh, a very difficult technique uh, that she needs to for uh, her her thesis, and she's successful, and she posts she posts the technique online. So there's a practical element here. It's uh, it's very important for students to understand the very complex implications. We don't want them to become copyright lawyers, but want them to understand that there are implications of posting things online, um, and that uh, we basically we want to instill a mindfulness about this, that they need to think beforehand before doing something like this. Um, uh, but at the same time, we understand that we're not there to teach them copyright law. Another case, for example, is uh, about a young, uh, a young attending who has to review a paper uh, that basically scoops um, or is related directly to uh, the projects of a student that's in their laboratory. And so this relates to um, conflict of interest and objectivity and, the, what, uh, and, uh, and get students to think about what that really means. That there certainly are tangible, clear-cut uh, conflicts of interest, financial and others uh, that we underscore. But at the, at the same time, there are, what, what is an objective conflict of interest and what that really means? And what are your responsibilities as a scientist to the field that, you know, perhaps this is a, 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 the papers in a field where there's only three or four people in the world who have the expertise to review it. How do you manage that? What are the internal controls that one needs to be an ethical uh, scientist to review a, par to review a paper uh, of a competitor, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of the kind of cases we have where there, we, again, try to, instill a certain sensibility to the issues, um, be practical, uh, uh, communicate facts, certain facts that they need to know, but at the same time, uh, get them to, to develop a certain mindfulness and a sensibility to the more conceptual issues that are raised by these cases. Now, in addition, I have a, a, a small budget uh, to supplement uh, the RCR program, and the students, uh, uh, and trainees, I've noticed, as well as many other people have noticed here, really crave uh, uh, to, uh, thinking about and acquiring tools for how to manage, actually, their relationships with their mentors. In particular, um, they are very concerned about um, how to have difficult conversations with their mentors, uh, how to manage the relationships if there are things about those relationships that they are experiencing is unfair. So a couple times a year, we have a couple workshops and at the workshop are psych several psychiatrists, uh, myself, uh, uh, some individuals from the postdoc office where we actually talk about uh, and help them uh, strategize uh, how to have these difficult conversations. And that this is something that we found is really important uh, to the trainees and the students. So again, so the program has very practical goals, um, but at the same time, we um, try to be aspirational, uh, even though we are only uh, uh, with them uh, eight hours during their entire uh, career as researchers at Boston University. And, uh, I think that's all I have. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, you reminded us of how important it is for researchers to be trained uh, with the responsible conduct, conduct of research and how basic and foundational that aspect of their training is. So even before they're producing work that goes out to the public, um, they have to really be trained and be reminded of uh, their responsibilities as researchers even as they're doing their very basic research. And uh, some of these issues you mentioned, um, the NSF or NIH actually flagged this as a concern back in the 1990s. So for uh, well over 25 years, um, this work has, uh, uh, these programs have been uh, existing on campuses and I would say that they're needed um, as much today, if not more. Um, as we train and send researchers out into the field. So thank you for sharing some information about the programs uh, that you're working with at, at BU. Um, so we actually um, have about five minutes before our scheduled break. 
I'm going to open um, up for questions, just maybe one, maybe two questions. Anyone um, has a question before we go to break? Um, we'll give you a minute or so to type up your question and send it in by chat. Um, if we don't get any questions, we'll just break a little bit early and we'll plan to reconvene on schedule at 1130. So we'll give you a minute to type up a question that you might have and send that over to us. Um, and if we don't get any questions, we're going to go ahead and break. So counting down, <laughs> you have about 30 seconds to get your question in. And of course, if, you, if you're not able to get your question in to us now, you'll have another opportunity later this afternoon to ask your questions. All right, so we're not getting any questions right now, so we're gonna go ahead and take a break and we will reconvene at 11.30 with our next group of presenters. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. If you're not able to join us um, for the rest of this morning's presentations, we appreciate your participation and um, we will sign back on at 11.30. Thank you. We want to get started with our second round of uh, Presentations beginning with our colleagues at Santa Clara University, Eric Tillman and Don Heider. Please go ahead. Okay, hello, I'm Eric Tillman. Um, so I'll give a little bit of a background at where STEM is at Santa Clara and then, and then go more specifically into how Claire Blue Blues um, fits into that. So Santa Clara, we're, at, we're at a pretty unique time in terms of our teaching and research within the STEM disciplines. We're in the process of the most massive and expensive building uh, building that we've put on campus up to this point. It's about a 300,000 square foot facility, and it's going to house the STEM departments within the college and also most of the School of Engineering. Um, even prior to moving into that, right now, student-centered research is at, a, is at an all-time high at Santa Clara. We have, for instance, just within the college, about $6 million of active grants. Um, current right now within um, the STEM departments of the college, and that's not even counting the School of Engineering. And so we're really outperforming, I think, um, a lot of our space, and so we're really excited to get these new facilities going. Um, at Santa Clara, we currently have two Claire Booth Luce professors. We have Grace Stokes in chemistry and biochemistry, and we have Nikki uh, Mushkat in math and computer science. Uh, since 1989, we've had over 10 Claire Booth Luce professors. In addition to these faculty professorships, we also award about 10 to 15 students um, undergraduate research scholar awards each year, which, which gives them $12,000 to devote towards, um, towards their research, both paying them a stipend for summer research and also allowing them to travel and to uh, buy supplies for their research project. So the professorships at Santa Clara University, the way that these have worked is that when we hire a faculty member in the STEM or engineering departments, departments that would be eligible, the candidate is reviewed as a possible Claire Booth Blues professor. And if the candidate meets the requirements, we then forward the materials to the Claire Booth Blues program for approval. And an offer is made to the candidate, and the Claire Booth Blues professorship is included in that offer. And we think that this is a, a very powerful tool for Santa Clara to, to um, recruit and to successfully hire the strongest women candidates in, the, in science and engineering. Um, just as an example, in chemistry and biochemistry, 40% of the tenure track faculty are women. And two of these currently in the department are either are Claire Booth Blues professors or were recent Claire Booth Blues professors. And so that really has helped us um, attract some, some top females into, into the chemistry and biochemistry department. Uh, what math and, and computer science have recently done on a hire was that they were explicit in their advertisements as they wanted a faculty member who was, who was committed to supporting um, and mentoring women undergraduates in math and computer science. And this led to the hiring of their current Claire Booth Blues professor, um, who I mentioned earlier, Nikki Mushkat. Well, we reached out to the two current Claire Booth Blues professors, Grace Stokes and Nikki Mushkat. Um, both have said that having the Claire Booth Blues professorship as part of their offer was a major factor in them deciding to ultimately come to Santa Clara and start their careers here. 
Um, in addition to the expected benefits of having these these research funds, which is which have allowed them really to hit the ground running as teacher scholars, they both they both um, separately have said how the, how childcare, the ability to pay for childcare, has been such a huge asset to them, both both from day to day in their in their job at Santa Clara, but also when they visit conferences and they attend conferences. Both of them have small children, and that's been that's been huge for them. And I would say in the Bay Area, with the high cost of living and the difficulty of getting getting faculty um, into housing uh, near the university, having that having those funds that can pay for childcare has been has been huge for them. Um, from the undergraduate research scholars, the way that we run that program here is a competitive program, and students propose a research project that they that they develop in consultation with the faculty member they would be working for that summer. And they then submit this, submit this proposal and it's looked at by a committee of, of faculty and administrators. And if chosen, the, the student will receive that Claire Booth Loose award and it allows them to stay full time for that summer. So it really kicks in that first summer and it pays them $20 an hour to do research over the summer, which helps provide funds for them to, to find housing. Um, in addition to the to the funds that they can pay for stipends, it also is used for conference travel. It's used for research supplies, and so it helps, of course, the faculty member in the entire lab um, from having a from having a student that has a Clear Blue Blues award. The students join a much larger cohort of students that stay over the summer. So, for instance, in in a lot of science departments, we might have about thirty five students that are staying over the summer doing full time research in different faculty members' labs. And one of the most difficult things is to, to find funds for these students. And so having Claire Booth Luce uh, award like these available for undergraduates allows us to maximize the number of students we're able to take into our research labs and also really elevate the few that get those awards because, it, because of the extra perks that comes, that comes with the Claire Booth Luce award. Um, and, and kind of as a last, Kind of summary here, though our our current and former Claire Booth Blues professors, they're um, they're strong leaders on campus, not just within the STEM community, but also just just more broadly on campus. Um, Amelia Fuller, who is a recent Claire Booth Blues board professor, um, she's going to currently this Friday she's going to be speaking to the board of trustees and represent the entire College of Arts and Science um, as 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 a teaching scholar of the highest order and really really allow them to hear what type of teaching and research is being done in the sciences here. Um, Grace Stokes, our current Claire Booth Luce professor, she's taken the lead on a program that, that gives first generation students, there's a cohort of first generation students each year that comes into Santa Clara, and she, she's taken the lead in helping place them into appropriate chemistry courses, the, chemist, the general chemistry courses, and also helping keeping them as a cohort so that they have camaraderie, that they're making sure that support systems are in place to, to ensure their success of getting through these, these introductory chemistry courses, which is gonna allow them then to go on and continue into, into the STEM fields. Um, the STEM departments within the College of Arts and Sciences are, are the physics, math and computer science, chemistry, biochemistry, neuroscience, public health, environmental studies, and biology. And we're going to take all of those departments, and those are the ones that are going to be co-located in the new facility for the School of Engineering. And those are also uh, those are also very popular majors for many students. So that's kind of the end of, of my summary of how the program works here. And uh, I'm Don Hyder. I'm the executive director of the Markless Center here. I'm just going to talk for a minute about uh, ethics in STEM here at uh, Santa Clara. Um, Marco Center and uh, the Computer Science Department, we're collaborating right now on a one-year Mozilla Award to integrate ethics into undergraduate computer science curriculum. And that work involves integrating ethics-related activities like case studies, projects into classes ranging from algorithms, data science, machine learning, cybersecurity, and more. The goal is to help computer science students exercise ethical, ethical thinking muscles as an independent plane of activity alongside their teaching, uh, their technical learning. Um, and we've been involved with the uh, engineering uh, school here for almost 30 years and also um, helping with ethics training. They've had a standalone ethics course in engineering for 
quite a number of years and all engineering students as part of their pro uh, senior project have to have a large ethics component and they give an award for the best uh, consideration of ethics in one of those projects. Um, and we'll also, we also offer an engineering ethics component on our website that's been downloaded and used by dozens of other universities around the world. And as part of this Mozilla grant we're working on with computer science, we'll take all that material we develop and also make it available on our website for other universities to use. Um, but we're, we also have 75 uh, faculty scholars who are involved with the Markula Center. We're the largest and most comprehensive applied ethics center in the world. And uh, we really um, enjoy our partnership with faculty across disciplines, including the STEM disciplines here, um, to keep ethics at the forefront um, of uh, thinking and teaching. Okay, wonderful. Um, I wonder if you could share with us a little bit, perhaps if you um, have a moment about how um, the significant growth of STEM, um, what impact, if any, if that's having on how Santa Clara addresses ethics. Um, given that you have such a large center, are you able to scale up the ethics programming along with um, the increase in, um, in STEM at the institution? Or is that, I understand that this is fairly new in terms of the massive awards and grants that you've received, but um, is that in the planning stages? Could you share a little bit more about, about that? Yeah, I mean, I think our, uh, we, we are, we do stand ready to help any faculty who are interested. Um, you know, we're in an interesting position because we're, um, we're a freestanding center and we're, we do a lot of work outwardly facing to help us, a lot of organizations who were, doing a lot of training at tech industry, in tech firms here in the Valley. And, uh, and we do ethics across nine different areas, bioethics and tech ethics and uh, religious ethics. So, so we're very broad ranging, but we have a long history of partnering with faculty here at Santa Clara to help them integrate ethics components into their courses. Um, and we make our, our services available, but it's, uh, Faculty and units have their own independence in terms of whether they want to come to us and ask for help or not. Um, we're actually recruiting more faculty to become scholars. We're having a, a reception this week to try to increase the number from 75 to even more faculty across campus. And we just did a campus-wide survey of our impact. And one of the main requests we got, which we're going to be working on this next year, is to help train more faculty in ethical decision-making and how to teach ethical decision-making in whatever discipline they teach in. But yeah, I think we're, we definitely have the resources and background and staff available that we can help um, the, the increase in terms of STEM teaching here at Santa Clara without problem. That's great, and I have just I have just one last question. Could you tell us a little bit more about the scholars and um, uh, what does it mean for a faculty member to become a scholar at the center? Yes, so uh, as a, we also have a steering committee, a faculty steering committee, so they, they uh, help guide us in terms of the best way to help those faculty scholars. But in general, we, we have a relationship where we'll convene a group of scholars to work on a grant application, for instance, in a particular area that's related to ethics. We're often called in because a lot of uh, grants now, especially in the hard sciences, have an ethics component in them. So we will help them write that part of the grant and execute it should they get the award. Um, and, and, um, and then what the scholars, how the scholars help us is we do, we produce a number of ethics materials. Again, that we put on our website and push out in a number of different ways. Uh, we're doing, we do web, page takeovers every few weeks on different current topics and often we'll call on faculty to write uh, ethical essays for that. For instance, we've done it on the California wildfires. We're about to do one here in the next couple months on um, climate change. And so uh, we call on faculty to help us. And then also we get contacted frequently by media to do interviews on ethics. And if it's not within our area of expertise, we'll refer to one of our faculty scholars to be able to do the interview. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Don and Eric, for sharing um, some more information about um, your work there at Santa Clara. Um, Eric, that was a fantastic adver advertisement for the Claire Bouffalous program.
I hope everyone was listening and, um, and how uh, Santa Clara has been able to leverage the receipt of its Claire Booth Luce Award to really have a significant impact on its campus. And Don, thank you for sharing um, some more information about the Marcella Center and about how um, faculty can become scholars at the center and how they can assist the institution with its work on ethics as a scholar. Happy to help. Wonderful. Thank you so much again for participating. So now we're going to turn to our next presenter, um, Dr. Alexa Rihanna Abdallah at the University of Detroit Mercy. Alexa, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Please, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, hi. So my name is Alexa Rihanna Abdallah and I'm a professor of environmental engineering in the Department of Civil, Architectural and Environmental Engineering at the University of Detroit Mercy. I, um, in our college, we have a, a course, Engineering 1000, that is Engineering Ethics, and it is taught by two faculty, one from Engineering and one from the Philosophy Department. And it's required for all engineering um, students because they have to take the FE exam, which is the fundamental of engineering practice exam. And this is uh, one part of this exam. So they have to take it. Uh, I haven't taught this course yet. Starting this fall, I will be one of the two instructors to teach it. But I would like to talk today about something um, a little bit different, about a course that I developed with a colleague of mine from mechanical engineering that talks about energy and society. And uh, I would like to talk about the ethical aspect in this course. Um, but before I go on, I would like to say that uh, as an environmental engineering professor, I do have a lot of ethical issues to teach in my course. For example, um, I teach a course in water and wastewater treatment. And um, as you might have known, recently we had a big problem with the Flint water crisis and the contamination, the lead contamination. So this was uh, a subject that, you know, we discussed in, um, in, in my uh, water treatment engineering course. And we talked a little bit about uh, the, so the socioeconomic aspect associated with it. <coughs> I my student that I live in, in Ann Arbor, which is, you know, a, a little bit more affluent part of, uh, uh, of the state compared to, to, to the inner city. Uh, and sometimes, um, Lot, or many times, a um, lot of environmental issues are associated with social justice and economical and social uh, status. Um, we talk also about a problem in um, the upper um, lower part of Michigan. This is a um, TCE contamination in groundwater and it happened in a, a rural area. And of course, because it's a rural area, the state does, did not uh, put a lot of resources to address this problem. However, this plume is moving toward uh, Lake Michigan, where we have a lot of resorts and a lot of uh, uh, beach and commercial uh, properties. And this is when they start getting uh, alarmed with that and they would like to find a problem. So, so I talked about ethical problem in my environmental classes. But today I'd like to discuss this course that I developed. It's called, as I said, uh, Energy and Society. And this is a course for non-engineering, for non-majors. So um, both my colleague and I were able to uh, get it accepted into the core curriculum for the university. So it's accessible for all the uh, students in the university. And we started, um, started this course because we realized that, uh, you know, people are aware of the energy challenges and the pollution that goes with that. And they talk about global warming and greenhouse production and all the resources, you know, like non-renewable resources that, that are dwindling. But um, really, they, that energy literacy rate is very low. 
uh, they don't understand the technical part of it. And um, we would like uh, to develop this course. We wanted to develop this course for non-technical students and hopefully to make them aware of not only the technology part of it, but also uh, how their attitude and behavior can, can affect um, energy production, energy consumption, and resources. And we talk about how um, we would like to, we, we talk about uh, a lot about sustainability and how we would like to make sure that we are using these resources wisely and, um, uh, and uh, leaving, you know, for the next generation, something to, to, to use. Um, so, because it's a core curriculum course, this uh, course was available to a um, lot of um, students and we had a big um, variety of uh, students from all majors, uh, from history and uh, English to uh, science and business. Um, and we, um, we developed this course uh, it has a goal and we did assessments, so it's a, uh, with outcomes and topics varies from, um, we started with the fundamental, like what is, how to use unit conversion, what are the first and second law of thermodynamics, to um, fossil fuels, the pros and cons of um, renewable versus non-renewable energy, um, how to do energy conservation, how to, um, how much, how safe is nuclear energy, how um, transportation and, uh, and industry, um, how much they consume as far as, uh, as energy, and finally, air pollution. Uh, so, we were uh, hoping to have them gain an appreciation of, of this uh, topic, and um, and we um, we had a project associated with this course that was uh, that that was a service learning where they went to a neighboring communities and they were able to um, to assess their um, energy usage and help them save some um, you know save as far as energy goes um so the ethical part of this this is what i would like to uh to to mention here we discussed environmental stewardship meaning um how come the united states with only five percent of the world's population consumes 25 percent of the world's energy resources but for this to uh, light the fundamental question of justice, we know that our standard of living is tied to the rate at which we use energy resources, right? So the rest of the world aspires to our standard of living, but uh, what does it mean in order for the rest of the world to use energy at the rate we do? Um, we need the resources of many, of more than one Earth, right? <laughs> um, so if we are to reject the scenario of maintaining the global status quo, what is our ethical responsibility? Do we sacrifice our standard of living and adopt a different lifestyle with less energy? Do we replace current energy resources with one that are renewable, meaning that we are willing to pay higher prices for this? Um, is it possible to do so and still consume the same amount of energy? Um, how can we lead a global effort to develop a technological, political, and economical strategies to ensure a more uh, equitable energy distribution? So, uh, at the beginning of the of the course, we um, we give the student a survey, a, a pro uh, survey, and then we do a post survey after that. And uh, the survey was taken from. Um, it's a national survey and we compare it to the survey that was given by the National Environmental Education and Training Foundation. 
and it uh, it tests their knowledge, of course, but also their attitude and behavior. And then we give the same uh, the same survey at the end of the course, and student can see first how much they learned, and this is help us to assess how much we reach our uh, outcomes, and um, what do we need to change for the next uh, time. But also it it make them uh, reflect and think about their attitude and behavior uh, regarding energy. Uh, I should say that one of the challenge in this course was um, given that uh, both faculties, uh, well, not one of them has retired, so I'm teaching it now by myself, given the fact that the faculty is an engineering faculty trying to tame our uh, enthusiasm for mathematical equations and calculation uh, because we have a non-technical audience was a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but we learned to uh, tame it down and uh, and have a right the right balance of qualitative and quantitative. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you share something that's really important, uh, which is that it's important for um, uh, not only for STEM students to think about STEM ethics, but also for non-majors and also public um, and yes. in fact this is one of the roles that um, uh, that many have stated uh, um, is a role and responsibility of those of us in the sciences is to um, share information about science um, to exactly. people who aren't scientists themselves in a way that they can understand it and use it and to really uh, communicate science um, to the public and as a way not only of addressing ethical issues but just in general and you know as one of the responsibilities that, that scientists have and obviously some people are better than others at that um, but it sounds like you've developed an amazing course and thank you so much for sharing some information about that with us you're welcome um, and thank you again for participating um, on the uh, with the convening today so we're going to move on now to um, dr rachel fink uh, of Mount Holyoke College, who's actually here with us at the foundation today. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a good excuse to come into New York City on a gorgeous day. I've been at Mount Holyoke for more than 30 years. It's a small liberal arts college in Western Massachusetts, historically for women. Um, and I'm a biologist. I've been a biologist my whole life. I teach embryology. I teach the largest laboratory course on campus. It's the second semester of introductory biology. So we have a program at Mount Holyoke where all entering students who are interested in biology take a small course taught by a faculty member, and it might be 16 students, it might be 20 students, and then all of that on specialized topics, and then, then all of them funnel into me and my partner, who is a uh, plant biologist, and we teach how organisms develop, a developmental biology course that focuses on animals and plants, and the highlight of the course from my point of view are the self-designed experiments where 150 students in pairs get to design their own experiments based on labs they've done where we fertilize sea urchin eggs so they all get to watch fertilization and they become in vitro biologists etc and they design their own experiments on plant behavior and plant uh, hormone behavior etc um, and it's been a great course and really fun to teach and I never had any ethics in it or explicitly or anything like that although to me the thought that you could watch fertilization and see the transformation and the formation of an embryo is by definition one of the most amazing ethical experiences anyone could have even though it's a sea urchin and not a human um, it ties into all kinds of questions that they're going to face for the rest of their lives. Um, and I've been teased that my mission on earth is to make sure that every man, woman, and child gets to see fertilization and merge. <laughs> I'm doing my best. Um, so that course has gone on. I've been teaching it for forever, and I love it, and it's a big lecture course. When I heard, as I mentioned this before, when I heard uh, the announcement, read the newspaper, saw the front page of the New York Times when Dolly the Sheep was announced, it seemed like that was a clarion call to try and think about all kinds of other issues to do with fertilization, early development, bioethics, etc. And I designed a course for upper level students. And it started out very small 
and I think back then it was called cloning, called um, bioethics and biology, or biology and bioethics, something like that. And it has then transformed over the years to stem cells, colon, to regenerative medicine, colon, <laughs> to whatever the hot topics are, but it's always been trying to get at the science first, because that's what I am, and that's where the students are who come to me although it has grown to include students that are not only biology students. And um, uh, when um, President Bush, for, uh, George W. Bush became president, um, I had been teaching this course for a couple of years, and he announced that he was going to start uh, create a bioethics panel, and it would be the council that meetings would be open to the public, he, they announced the people who were going to be on it, and it was widely criticized from the left, and audit from the right and all different kinds of uh, politics came into it but it was a group a very disparate group of experts whose t job was to talk about and inform the public about bioethics and of course one of the first topics was the uh, discovery and use of human embryonic stem cells and this council's meetings were all of the uh, Transcripts were available online. You could read every word that any one of them said. And I thought I wanted to use that somehow in my class. So first we just paid attention to it and I had the students look at it. But over the years then it became a goal where I had the students each take on the persona of one of the members of the council. And they read everything that that person said. They, you know, as YouTube became even more and more and they could see videos of them um, and they then got tried as their best to get into the heads of that person and really have a way of expressing very complicated topics um, without having to have their own personal beliefs put on the line. It can be very hard for an undergrad to sit in a discussion about abortion or sit in a discussion about death and uh, brain death and how do you define it or any of those things. If um, if she's not that confident in her background, in her feelings, and yet we really want them to wrestle with these topics, and yet if she is presenting the views of Leon Cass, who was the, at the time the chairman of the Presidential Bioethics Council, or the views of a religious scholar, or the views of whomever, they all get to choose who they want it to be, um, then they could really dive into the conversation and uh, both support each other and uh, sort of attack each other's views without it being personal. And we had all kinds of really exciting discussions. I then decided that I wanted to bring the two classes together. And so I then had the upper level students come to my 150 student intro class for a day, a class of bioethics. And the panel would come in and they'd be introduced as um, here is President Bush, or here is Senator Brownback, or here is Leon Cass, or here is bioethicist so-and-so, or here is Nobel Prize winner, etc. And um, they came in and they presented a mock debate about whichever topic we were talking about that year um, in front of the intro students. And that has become something I enjoy more than almost any other kind of teaching I do. The students are, by the end of the semester, the upper level students own that material. They own that person in a way, they own those views. They are ready to dive in. They are ready for any question that comes from left field. Um, they are authoritative. That doesn't change their own views necessarily. It doesn't have to represent their own views. Some students will uh, pick a person who they relate to and some people will pick a person that is diametrically opposed to their own personal views. And it's just astounding to watch the transformation of the upper level students as they then are able to answer questions about when does life begin? Why should we uh, fund research on this? How do you, you know, what is a CRISPR baby um, just a few weeks ago, et cetera. So that class that brings together the upper level students and the uh, first year students um, has worked really, really well. The upper level students design a questionnaire. We just heard about a questionnaire for a little class. The upper level students design a questionnaire that they give to the intro students a few days before that just gets them thinking about the topics. And I give the intro students a one lecture science background right before the bioethics panel. 
So I give a lecture on uh, nuclear transfer, somatic cells, um, embryonic stem cells, regenerative medicine, cloning, all kinds of whatever we need for them to get ready, in vitro fertilization, et cetera. Um, and then they have, they've done this questionnaire on the ethics, um, answering very tough questions in sort of soundbite answers. They hate that, but that's how it's presented in the world and many times, you know, uh, would you eat cows? Would you eat meat from cloned cows? Would, do you support uh, in vitro uh, extra IVF uh, embryos being used for research? What should happen to all of the frozen IVF babies, uh, embryos in the world? All kinds of things. And when does life begin? Circle it on the timeline below. So they get those questions, they come in, then they have the eight to 12 uh, experts, and you can hear a pin drop during the presentations. I've been asked, wouldn't it be better if you could have the whole Bioethics Council come themselves? Wouldn't it be great if you could bring in Elizabeth Blackburn, or you could bring in um, uh, Michael J. Fox to talk about Parkinson's. Wouldn't it be great if you could bring in these real people? And why don't you write a grant to bring in the Bioethics Council? And I thought it would be much less effective. My students are very used to having um, leading experts come through and being talked to by, uh, I don't want to use the word grown-ups in an insulting way, <laughs> but using, but being talked to by, by you know, the, the real people. We have all kinds of seminar series, etc. And yet to see their classmates, only two or three years older than them, owning this material and really willing to dive into what does it mean to work with human embryos? What does it mean to be able to transform the genetic code of an organism? What does it mean to be able to do this, this kind of work? And who should decide? How do we decide? What if you're a Muslim? What if you're a Jew? What if you're a Christian? How do you tackle these questions? How do you put those different parts of your life together that seeing their classmates do this is extraordinary for them? And I think many of my first year students have told me that at that moment they've decided they want to learn more about these topics and they want to take the class when they're a senior so they can come in and be an expert, <laughs> etc., and do all that. About 15 years ago, I got funding to um, take my class to Washington, D.C. And so I've done that now six or seven times where the class, even though there isn't a Bioethics Council under our current president, um, under President Bush and under President Obama, I think it was seven times I've taken my class down to D.C. and we attend the meeting. They're open to the public. Um, we would have dinner with council members. If you write them and say, I have students who want to be you, you know, and <laughs> pretend to be you, they tend to be very, very open to uh, having dinner um, uh, you know, at, a, at a restaurant in Washington and talk about the backstage. I've arranged for White House tours. I've arranged for them to meet uh, lobbyists from the American Society for Cell Biology. They've met with staffers for congressmen and senators. They've uh, met with um, just all kinds of people. When you start planning a trip to D.C., it's very easy to find people from a wide range of uh, careers that my students then might want to, to take on. So they've been very welcome at the meeting. They're very uh, blunt about what they think of the meetings and the uh, presentations. And some years have been quite dull, to be honest. Some years have been wildly exciting in terms of the material. And the students have gotten so much out of it. They then, uh, and some of them have had chance to have dinner with their person, the <laughs> person, the expert that they're pretending to be. And that's always been a really amazing thing. Um, so to me, the best parts of it are bringing together the upper level students and the first years. The best parts are seeing that real people tackle these topics and there are groups out there that are, uh, whose mandate is to try and teach the public about this uh, complicated world that we live in and to think about questions that not everybody thinks about, um, that the topics are hard, that the questions are deep, that the answers are confusing, if there are any answers. Um, I have every year insisted that on the questionnaire that my upper level students write for the intro students to take, that I get the chance to have my one favorite question, which is, I believe I, well, I have enough scientific background to discuss these issues. And you either agree or disagree with that. 
And it always appalls me that it's not 100% to say, of course, I have enough scientific background. And it's some years it's as depressing as 40, 60. Some, and that's just because of the nature of being 18 years old and a college student and all kinds of things. Some years we've gotten up to 70% to say that they do have enough scientific background, which is good. But I always look at the class and what I tell them is, you have a second semester college students at a liberal arts institution who's taken a year of biology. You have more background information than almost everybody in Congress, than almost everybody in the Senate, than almost everybody in Washington, who are, you know, which should really give you confidence that you need to talk about these things. You need to go ahead. You need to follow up and that, yes, you can tackle them, even though there's not uh, one answer for any of these questions. It's been a real joy to teach it. I keep trying to come up with ways to transform it, to find funds. The years we don't go to Washington for all kinds of logistical reasons, I take them to Harvard has an annual bioethics conference that we can afford through wonderful private grants, et cetera. Um, I've taken them to STEMCon, which is Connecticut for many years, had a meeting of stem cell biologists. A lot of it was complicated science, but some of it was touching on the ethics and asking about that. So I always try and get a field trip in somewhere because that really helps hit home. And um, it's just been a really interesting ride. And I never know what the topics are going to be because until I read the headlines, I don't know where science is taking us. And it's really fun to bring the students along. Thank you so much, Rachel. Did you mention at one point that one of your students had decided to go into ethics? Uh, many of the students go on most, let's see, many of the students think they want to be physicians, which is a wonderful goal. Many of them then find all kinds of challenges on that route. So I've had students then realize by going to Washington, by listening to the panel, that there's so many different ways to share your excitement and enthusiasm for science. Um, one of my, the students who was on the first trip to DC with me, who uh, had a fantastic time, went on and did research at, uh, uh, Pfizer for a year as a biochemistry major. She worked there for a few years as a hardcore scientist, realized she really wanted to dig into these other questions, went to law school, graduated from Harvard Law, went and worked at a small firm that dealt with um, reproductive law questions. Who uh, sort of, uh, if surrogacy is legal in one state but not in another state, how do you drive back and forth, just incredibly complicated questions. She worked there, she worked at a large law firm, and now she's the head of a bioethics center at Yale Law School. And uh, comes in fact to my class every year and teaches one section to the class. And Katie is one of the most amazing young women I've ever met. And remembering her back starting in the first trip to DC was, was a really fun path to see how she's, where she's gone. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, it's really fascinating to hear about your experiences taking students out into the field. And also um, really heartening to hear that exposure and experience and participation in these kinds of events and activities can really um, help develop someone's future career. Um, that Maybe they never thought about this as being a path for them but it really opens up uh, doors and other ways that they can use their science. So thank you for sharing that sure. with us. So now we're gonna have our last set of presenters, Joan DiBello and uh, Gina Florio from St. John's University. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Joan and I'm here with Gina over here from St. John's, that's Carlotta I mentioned. And um, we're going to talk about um, the way we incorporate ethics within our program uh, courses, but also within the university and answer a couple of the other questions that were um, brought in for part of our discussion here um, for, for today. So in my, my division, I'm the chair of the computer science, math and science division for the college professional studies. And we have a couple of different majors within our program. We have computer science, of course, and we also have cybersecurity, uh, healthcare informatics, and networking. But within the computer science and the cybersecurity, there's a lot of different um, ethical issues that come into um, our courses in terms of hacking. And one of the faculty members who was the person who started up our program 
before um, cybersecurity um, had decided that it would be a good idea if our students signed the White Hat Agreement. So they um, created the little uh, form that's basically a lot of schools out there have um, the same thing. And they signed this White Hat Agreement that they will um, hack for the purposes of their courses and do things in an ethical way and not use it to do anything harmful. To the university or afterwards or while they're um, while they're here as a student um, with that a lot of our other um, professors created a their own little agreement I have one myself that all the students sign on the first day of class is on an info sheet and it actually makes them sign a form that they will promise that they will do their own work because computer programming there's so much stuff out there to find and you know we don't want them to cheat or do anything um, you know, from another student or, or, you know, pass it on to another student. Because a lot of them don't even realize that helping by giving the information to another student is still cheating. It's not, you know, that they stole it without them looking. It's still cheating by giving it to them and trying to help them. And um, we also have them sign the form that, well, I have them sign the form that says if they do see this, that they'll let us know so that we can, um, we can you know, tell them that that's not really the right way to go about um, the course. Um, in my class as well, um, it's an introductory level course for freshmen, and I do a service learning project. Uh, service learning is an important um, part of our university because all students uh, take it through a course that's called the Discover New York class here at, at the school, but a lot of the programs um, have created them within their own disciplines. And within the computer science course, I create a um, cybersecurity um, pamphlet with the students. They work in groups of up to two, or they can do it alone. And they create a whole um, pamphlet on internet safety, on how to, how to um, use the internet correctly, how to deal with um, issues that might arise, um, how to not put any schemes or scams out there, any phishing attacks, things that might be of that kind of sort of information, what to do with data once it's collected, depending on the different age groups that we're working with. Some of them will write it towards the elementary schools, the middle schools, the high schools, or even for the elderly um, people in like a senior center or one of those uh, places in the library. And we send these pamphlets over to the service learning office and the service learning office will print them out and distribute them to wherever the age group is appropriate. Um, each year we have an event where we have a, a local school come into campus um, with my students and we um, do a little, I do a little presentation on safety, security, all that kind of fun stuff with cybersecurity, but then also go into cyberbullying and how um, cyber ethics is important in, in the world we live in today. And a lot of the students uh, really do enjoy that presentation because we do that for a short time with the students from campus and then actually do a little um, scratch programming too to get them excited about programming on campus. And we have pizza and stuff and it's a whole cute event. But aside from myself, there's another um, a faculty member who's from the philosophy department in our division, and she does a similar thing with cyberbullying. It's really big, uh, really big um, for her and her research. She's actually gone to China to present this, and her and a professor from the um, communications division has, has worked together on this. And they have a larger group of students come in um, to the campus every year, and they do an event um, with that as well. Um, one of our faculty members who unfortunately had recently passed away, uh, myself, him, and a group of people from our division worked with the philosophy people to create a grant last year that was the Gen Cyber uh, grant funded by the NSF and NSA. And one of the main components within that grant was ethics in, in computer science and cybersecurity. And there was a whole day that was dedicated to um, cyber and ethics within the, within the camp. And um, that, that was really a great opportunity for students to, to learn about cybersecurity, to learn about computer science, but also how to incorporate ethics within uh, the component. Um, myself and that faculty member who passed away actually presented a paper on service learning in our courses. He did one, he does his, well, he did his with the graduate level uh, students. and. He worked with um, databases in specific um, organizations, whichever ones that he would he would have worked with, and 
I did mine with the pamphlet and we presented at the CCSC Eastern um, Conference, not this October, but the October before, and the paper was published. So we, it, it's important for us uh, to incorporate ethics in all of our courses. Um, one of our major courses that the students take is CSS 1021, which is the Cyber Law and Ethics course. So there's a course dedicated to it for our majors. And we also have the CUS 1174, which is an artificial intelligence course, which also incorporates um, ethics in it. Right now in the fall, we're going to be creating, well, the first cohort of graduates will be entering in our new master's program, and one of the tracks is in artificial intelligence. And I, I do some research with robots and artificial intelligence, and a couple of papers and things on cyber ethics and, and cyber security and the issues and privacy and concerns that deal with that. So it's really important to me with, with those issues. So we have some really cool robots. If any of you are around, <laughs> you know, to see John's uh, genus of them. They're, they're pretty cool. <laughs> a lot of our faculty are working on things that do with natural language processing and ethics and machine learning. And there's so much out there right now on you know, artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence and the ethics behind it. So that's one going to be one of the programs that we're going to be working on projects with the students in the fall semester. It's going to be research related to that. Jane has some more stuff she's going to talk about with our university. So, yeah, initiatives. <laughs> Thanks um, for that uh, good introduction. And now I actually know. I have another resource for the course that I'm teaching. I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, but I want to say, sort of, I I came of age in um, in my um, my scientific research discipline of molecular electronics around the time of the showing uh, case research uh, research research misconduct case at Bell Labs uh, around 2001. And 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 so, if you're not aware of that, it's a, um, at the time everyone was looking for ways to make electronic devices with molecular organic materials and um, with you know, important properties like switching and superconductivity and, and, um, and Sean published 25 papers in the field um, with amazing results on devices. And people within Bell Labs started to become um, skeptical and suspicious of his findings when they discovered that the data was often repeated itself so different devices had similar or identical behavior and the the data looked very clean right and so there were all these things that that made them sort of start to look at what was going on and of those 25 papers um their internal uh investigation into showing research misconduct showed that 16 of them um contained fabricated data um there were over 20 different co-authors from research laboratories across the world that were um, part of this um, part of these uh, these studies. Um, they were all cleared of wrongdoing, but it had a, a really massive ripple effect. And and you know, in in that field at that time, um, in addition to fabrication, right? So this is a very prominent example of fabrication. There were also uh, a number of other um, other examples of negligence or error um, that have made their way into the, the, the literature and have to this day still not been retracted. Um, and it's something that was sort of formational for me coming into the field at that time, um, working as a postdoc at uh, Columbia in the Nano Center trying to build these kind of devices with, um, with individual molecules and not being able to replicate, you know, the, the kind of things that people were claiming that they saw. Um, so, and then that fine line, or not fine line, I don't know, that the distinction between what is error, right, and negligence and what is misconduct. And, and so that's something that I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, but more recently have had an opportunity to bring into my, um, uh, into a course setting at St. John's. And so you've heard about Joan's examples of individual kind of interventions around ethics um, in, her, uh, in her courses and um, programs in computer science and cyber uh, security. Um, in, uh, in the 
sciences within my college, uh, we're at different colleges, I'm in arts and sciences, um, there are less examples of explicit courses based in ethics, except for um, our core curriculum, which has a, has a, a philosophy um, ethics course that all students take as part of their um, first year typically first year. Yeah, the whole curriculum. university takes it, no matter what college that they're in. in the same right. And I'll tell you about something that we're trying to do, which builds off of that foundational course uh, in a moment. But um, I want to take a minute to tell you about a course that I've been teaching, uh, that I taught for the first time this year, a two semester long course um, based undergraduate research experience or CURE called Solving the Big Problem. And um, it's the course is a centerpiece of our NSF STEM scholarships in STEM award um, and it's supported to this to date 39 individual students in two cohorts um, over the past two academic years plus we've identified a third cohort for next year um, these students are selected to participate in the stem um, scholars program at st john's where we provide them with financial support through this NS through the nsf grant as well as this course-based undergraduate research experience that they take in their second year. So we're, we're identifying students in their first year um, at St. John's, and I can discuss why we do that uh, later on if, if you're interested. Um, but we really have as a goal of the overall program to, um, to grow a STEM pipeline um, and to, um, to broaden uh, participation. So uh, it's been, um, so far, the program itself has been impactful in those capacities. Um, we have 69% uh, of our students have been female, um, or identify as female, 38% of them are in traditionally underrepresented um, populations as defined by the NSF, um, African American, Latinx, and Native, um, Native, Native, let's see, Hawaiian or Alaskan um, or American students so uh, and then 56 percent of the students classify as either high or very high financial need so these are students at, that are Pell eligible or just above or just sort of with family incomes just above Pell eligibility um, so in this two semester course uh, our students are given a topic so a general theme a prompt um, which is a big problem of societal uh, importance um, so water or um, climate change, and then they are, um, or local issues, and then they are basically use um, a lot of different approaches, including design thinking, which we heard about earlier today, um, to ideate, design, and develop, and then implement their own research projects around that central theme. So they work in, in teams to do this. Um, and so uh, this course focuses both on the process of science and its products um, as a because these are introductory level students in stem um, they need lots of skill building activities throughout the, the, the course um, and so my role as an instructor is really to help them um, build those skills and to connect them with a broader network of people who can assist them in their research throughout the year um, so one of the skills that we build is by explicitly treating uh, responsible conduct and research and STEM ethics. And I use um, the National Academy's um, on, being a, on Becoming a Scientist, Ethical Conduct and Research um, booklet. It's just a pamphlet. Uh, and it has really nice, succinct um, definitions of lots of different um, important sort of topics within responsible conduct and researchers in general, introduction, advisement, mentoring, how you treat data, what's the difference between negligence and error versus fabrication, um, how you respond to research misconduct, um, authorship, allocation of credit, how we share our research results, so all of the things that we've been hearing about so far in our discussion today, and generally the role of the researcher in society, dealing with human subjects, animal subjects, I guess you don't do afford to birth, so <laughs> right. so yeah, in your course, so you don't have to maybe uh, do some IRB work there, but um, but you know, so and because I don't know what the students are going to choose to do their research on, and we give them a pretty wide open landscape, um, we sort of make sure they have access to all of this information 
um, which would not normally come up with a, in a chemistry course. You wouldn't necessarily talk about dealing with human subjects, right? So an IR, uh, IRB approval of your research. Um, so, so the students um, work uh, sort of in, in teams to tackle a couple of these chapters. Um, they do some, some um, case studies and then they report out for a debriefing with the, the larger group on their topics and, and so we develop some, um, some good uh, um, discussion in, that, in those sessions. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in now is assessment of the efficacy of this intervention. And so it's been interesting to hear what other people are doing here today and hopefully people are amenable to being uh, contacted for additional follow-up regarding assessment of efficacy. Um, we are, so, so that's one example of a sort of individual intervention. We also have talked about things where we've got departmental or divisional change and then um, bigger uh, institutional efforts. Um, so one of the things that, that we're um, hoping to do and with uh, some colleagues of ours have submitted a proposal through the NSF Cultivating Cultures for Ethical STEM um, program is to build off of our core curriculum um, which has a strong theology and philosophy components as we are a Catholic um, institution. And so Catholic social thought and Catholic and Vincentian intellectual tradition is important at our institution as foundational to all of our students, um, our STEM students uh, experience. So build off of that um, and develop a center for STEM ethics, um, maybe doing the work that, that many of our other colleagues today have, have discussed. Um, in, in a more kind of complete and systematic way. Um, we also have a lot of contact with our Vincentian um, colleagues. So the Vincent, so our Office of Institutional Mission, um, one of the Vincentian um, uh, priests uh, runs a center for church and society. And every other year has uh, Ro Rosalie Rondu roundtable discussions where he brings together STEM um, faculty, um, other professionals, theologians, and philosophers to discuss um, ethical issues. Um, and then my personal <laughs> hope is that we can use our CURE model um, to sort of bring research, undergraduate research to scale at St. John's, and that as part of that, we would um, impact a broader community of students with our um, discussions of, of ethics and, and responsible conduct, but, um, but research more broadly. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much to Joan and Gina for sharing um, some of the work that they're doing at St. John's. Um, and you know, issues such as cyberbullying um, might seem to be kind of outside the realm of what you would think about talking about in a college classroom, but it's so important um, in our society to, today that um, I, I believe that we almost have a responsibility to address these kinds of issues along with issues of, of hacking and the other kinds of activities that students with computer science knowledge can undertake. So thank you so much for sharing that. And it was really interesting to hear about how St. John's is integrating ethics into every level of the institution and some of the ongoing work that you're doing. So thank you very much for sharing. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and break for lunch. We'll reconvene at 1.15 p.m. And at that point, we'll have our open roundtable discussion of the morning presentations and, um, and thoughts for the Room for Wisdom blog, which we're planning. So I would encourage you, uh, those of you who are um, participating by Zoom, to think about some of the questions you might want to ask, and feel free to go ahead and, and um, send, us to, uh, send those to us through the chat function. And when we come back from lunch at 1.15, we'll start to uh, address some of your questions. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with our roundtable discussion um, of the morning presentations and any thoughts for the Room for Wisdom blog. Um, so far, we haven't received any questions from our participants. So if you're uh, out there and you have a question that you'd like to ask of our panelists who are still with us, of our uh, presenters, please be sure to go ahead and send us that question by chat. I'm going to go ahead and get, get us started here. Um, and I'm going to start by asking our presenters, um, specifically Rachel, Joan, Gina, and Alexa, 
given their experiences in the classroom, um, how are students reacting to and engaging with, um, with the ethics material? Um, we've heard about one example of a student who actually went on to, to choose ethics as a career. But short of that, how do you believe your students are being transformed by this work? Um, and I'll start with uh, Rachel and um, then go to Gina and Joan and then to Alexa. Um, I guess I see a lot more interest. Um, the intro students then will come and talk about, I use the phrase reading the newspaper, even though that doesn't really, isn't how they get the news these days, but that's my uh, general one for paying attention to what's out there. They will, in their upper level classes, after hearing the bioethics panel by their classmates, they will email me, I just heard about this, I heard about that, they will pay more, much more attention. Students are interested in asking about different careers. They're interested in um, when they hear that students, there are meetings that are going on all around the country and the world that are open to the public. Could I go? Do you think this would be interesting? Yes, I mean, I think they're much more engaged. Not all of them, of course, but I think there are some um, students look into public health more as opposed to straight medicine um, and how they can link that to the rest of the world and what they've heard. So I'd like to hope that it opens their eyes a little bit. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so specifically, um, what I've seen is students, uh, again, interest, as, as Rachel mentioned, interest in uh, having conversations about, um, about authorship, about mentoring, about what the right way or the wrong way, right? The right or the wrong. I mean, they're, they're, these are um, sort of young uh, students early in their academic careers. So, um, so those don't seem, so the, the issues still seem pretty black and white to the students that I'm working with, um, but that they're willing to engage in those conversations as follow-up. Um, and, you know, I, I, I would also hope that through these kind of programs um, or sort of interventions, uh, educational uh, opportunities that we're providing students with those alternate kind of career paths in STEM. Sure. And um, with my class, the, the students um, all seem to enjoy the service learning project and learning about ethics, but more importantly, um, giving back to the community um, what they've actually learned. So I have some quotes that some of them have written. So um, one student said that despite the enormous number of applications internet can, the internet can provide, using it still comes with plenty of risks. These risks including phishing, computer viruses, identity theft, cyberbullying, and many other dangers. The dangers are why we need to be informed and up to date with crucial information that can protect us. That is why it's important for us to create these brochures and internet safety. Another one wrote that as technology gets more and more advanced, so do the scammers who attempt to ruin people's lives and deceive. Uh, they decided to, uh, we decided to target age 65 and above because the elderly are starting to take classes to learn how to use computers. We want the elderly people to learn how to use technology effectively and safely. And another one wrote, when we were younger, nobody was there to help us learn about internet safety. Rather, we had to teach ourselves. I mean, who was going to help us exactly? Our parents who came from third world countries who barely spoke a lick of English, they were just as confused with the online web as we were. So it's very important that, you know, they enjoy learning about this, but then giving it back to other people. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Alexa, uh, let's, I think we need to unmute you. Or maybe you can unmute yourself. Okay, I think we're okay. I think, yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So in my energy class, uh, we did the survey, the post and the pre and post survey, and of course, knowledge of uh, energy issues uh, have improved. They know more now, but most importantly, in their attitude and behavior changes. Um, some uh, said that they did not think about um, about some of the questions in the survey as uh, uh, they used to think about it previously. And most importantly, you know, they did this uh, service learning project. And uh, with our university, this is like a big, um, you know, the same, we share the same values. And we, uh, Whatever they did in this project really impacted their thinking. So now they make 
more conscientious uh, behavior toward uh, conserving energy. So conservation of energy came as a uh, common theme throughout the course. And they realized that uh, it's easier to uh, prevent pollution rather than at the end coming and trying to um, mitigate all the problems that created afterwards. So uh, instead of trying to find solution afterwards, it's easier to, uh, to do it at the front end of it. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Alexa. Okay. So we have a couple of questions from our um, participants. We have another question that's focused on students. So actually, this is a question from another one of our presenters who would like to hear from others. Um, curious to know what ways others have been able to inspire students to attend non-required workshops on ethics. We have a small core group of students who are interested, but most seem turned off by anything labeled ethics. So do you have any suggestions or any of our panelists who are still participating on how to get students engaged and interested in ethics classes? One of the suggestions, well, two of the suggestions I have is that when we have guest speakers every once in a while, I, I run the learning communities for our, our division as well. I have so many different hats. <laughs> and um, we offer extra credit to the students if they attend. Mm -hmm. So if they attend, they get some extra credit for a class. But also free food. If you get pizza, they come. <laughs> they don't care what the topic is. <laughs> Universal. So that sounds great for um, yeah. like a visiting lecture or a seminar. Um, what about those semester long courses in ethics? How do you get students interested in those? Any suggestions? Well, I know one of the, so I, we had mentioned that we have a core course in philosophy, which is an ethics course that students have to have to take, which is their perspective. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the ways that they have accommodated the different needs um, and in interests of students is to have them thematic. So there's a health sciences version, other business ethics. So I think, you know, that that's one approach yeah. um, that then draws, it becomes a draw for students to, to enroll in those based on interest. Yeah, it's more discipline specific. Okay. And so, yeah. I think that more students might potentially take those courses. I think at Mount Holyoke we tend to have wait lists for many of the classes, and so it doesn't seem to be. But we don't have a required ethics source across the curriculum that we've been hearing about. Um, but uh, uh, the medical ethics classes, medical anthropology, all of those are very over enrolled and have lots of students waiting. I think one of the best ways is to get students to be the sponsors of things. So if you ask a group of students. Who would you want to invite to be a speaker about topic X, Y, and Z? Or how would you advertise this class? Let the students talk to each other is the best route I have found. And so in the class classes I talked about, lots of students come because a classmate told them their classmate or, or their friend is presenting or introducing the speaker or something like that. So having the students encourage other students is the best way to get them. Okay, great, thank you. Um, are any of our other presenters who might still be online via Zoom um, available who might want to answer this question as well? You may need to unmute yourself or send us a chat really quickly and, and we can un unmute you ourselves here. So I'll wait a few seconds to hear from any of our additional panelists. Okay, well, I hope that that question, by the way, was from John Lubker. I hope that, John, you found some of those answers helpful, and I would encourage you to reach out to some of the other presenters um, who have some ideas for how, um, how to engage students in those uh, non-required ethics courses um, after the convening. I'm certain that they'll be able to provide some more information. Okay, so I want to move to the next question, which is actually about a question um, that I had uh, myself, which is related to um, science, communicating science to the public. Um, so the question is, um, clearly ethics in STEM is a topic, is an, um, clearly ethics in STEM as a topic is an applied science, but still, how can it convincingly get beyond the academic, especially considering the current climate 
what are the best ways to get beyond the vilification of empirical knowledge as fake, a hoax, or alarmist? How can we better educate the public? So, do any of our um, uh, presenters here want to, in the uh, in the loose office want to address um, what are some of the ways that you've identified to share your science um, and your particularly as it relates to STEM ethics um, to the public? And maybe even address some of these questions about um, what's uh, what's real or fake, or what's a hoax and what's um, alarmist. I know that's a that's a really <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's an important question. Yeah. I think that's one we're all grappling with right now, and I wish I had an answer or, or any kinds of answers. I think anytime you talk to the public. Um, engage parents when they come to the campus, and they then spread it out farther. Uh, I work at a local elementary school, not specifically on ethics, but then the students come to, the children come to campus, their parents come to campus with them as, you know, uh, uh, chaperones, all kinds of ways to be able to talk about it and show that science is worthwhile and engaging rather than uh, confusing and awful. <laughs> Um, I don't have good answers for that. That's what we all are really struggling with. Mm -hmm. So taking every opportunity to mm -hmm. educate whoever you come in contact with is one way of doing it. Um, any other um, suggestions anyone here has? I mean, Joan, you're, you're, the programs that you're, you've been yeah. running have been directly designed to engage external constituents, so, mm -hmm. yeah. students. So younger students, like elementary school students? Yeah, um, well, some of them are elementary, some are middle school, and middle some are high school as well. Yeah. Okay, so catching them young yes. and, uh, <laughs> and helping them to, to think critically about um, science, but also informing them more about the sciences. Great. Um, do any of our online panelists have anything they'd like to share on that question? What are the best ways to educate the science educate the public about science? Well, as an environmental engineer, I am always faced with a lot of uh, problem of out questions about what's true, what's real, and what's not, as you said, like the hoax, right? And most importantly, the is climate change a real problem we are facing? So uh, other than showing them data and statistics, I try to show them also, um, especially for my non-science major in in, uh, in the environmental science class that I, that I teach, and then with the energy and society class, uh, I show them documentary. And one of them usually, uh, the one I usually like is, um, it's called Chasing Ice. And it shows how um, our ice cap and uh, glaciers are, uh, melting. And usually uh, after seeing a documentary, uh, as they say, an image is worth a hundred or thousand words, they are more uh, convinced and impressed with it. So giving them case studies or giving them uh, or showing them documentaries can be also an effective way to disseminate the uh, information. Okay, great. Um, and I also wanted to mention um, that one of my alma maters, um, uh, Stony Brook University, has a program, the Alan Alda program, and I, I'm not sure if I have the title exactly. Uh, for, it's a Center for communi Communicating Science and the, and the Public, or to the Public. Um, and they will work with um, institutions and individuals at those institutions to translate their science for the public. So there are organizations now that are helping those of us in academia or those who work with academics to find ways to translate their science from you know, all the scientific jargon that we tend to use when we're communicating with each other to language that can be understood by the general public and on topics that are of interest to the general public. Um, and also one of the, the goals with our blog is really to get um, people outside of our kind of small higher education world 
um, thinking about these issues and get them interested in these issues as well, because the blog will be available on the Henry Luce Foundation's website, which is open literally to pretty much everyone in the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, it won't, although we anticipate that most of the people who visit the blog will be people in the higher education community, um, it's not definitely not limited um, to that community. So I think every little thing that every person can do, um, and you know, we recognize and I recognize certainly that I'm not an expert on communicating science to the public, but there are people who are more expert in that, who are available to assist. Um, and then also touching young people, very young people, elementary school, middle school, um, before they become really um, big consumers of information that's out there, to be able to think critically about what's available is another way to, um, to address that. Um, so uh, I think really kind of doing what you can, and if, if you wanna do more, there are resources out there that can help you um, do more. And if each of us does something, um, then it's bound to have a significant positive impact. At least I hope so. Okay, so we have, uh, oh, John? Yeah, so one thing that we're trying to do in my program and with graduates is uh, move past sort of, where, or, or at least have a discussion where responsibility for one's research starts and where it ends. With graduate students, a lot of the mentality is I'm responsible for creating new research. But after the creation and once it's out in the world, I might be done with it. And we really try to engage with our graduate students about how creation of new science is not just enough, but how to shepherd that responsibly into the community or into the Research the uh, Pew Research Center put out a really interesting article on September 11th of 2017 about how people approach facts and information. And it talks about um, how people either deal with new knowledge or, stre or are stressed out about maybe contrary knowledge. And they talk about different groups as either eager and willing or confident to the cautious and curious, and even, even to the doubtful and the wary. And so if people are interested in looking at how, how and why people respond to new information in different ways, I would suggest looking that up. And I can, Carlotta, I can send you the link to, uh, to this article as well. Great, and we can make that link available to everyone. But I think you, you uh, raise a really important issue, John, which is that we may not be able to get everyone to be engaged, but if we can get those first two groups that you mentioned, the ones that are curious and the ones who want to know more, mm -hmm. um, and, and educate those people about, um, about science, um, we may never be able to get everyone, but if we can at least provide information that those two groups can consume, I think we will have gone a really long way sure. towards addressing some of these issues. Um, but it is important for us, and it, again, if, if you're a scientist and you're not good at doing this yourself, um, identifying a partner, whether that partner is someone at your institution or at a center like the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science um, to the public, um, to help you to be able to uh, translate that information, I think that it's something that could be uh, quite worthwhile. I would add that many of the um, professional uh, societies are also doing this. So the American Society for Cell Biology, the Society for Development of Biology, groups that I belong to, now have all kinds of contests for graduate students, for elevator speeches, for making a video that explains some scientific content. They have workshops on how to translate your very complicated, uh, tiny, tiny piece of the world that you're trying to study and bring it up to a, a level um, that anybody can understand. I think the societies are doing amazing work, at least the ones that I see, in really helping people think about it, even if they don't do it, they understand the need for it. Mm -hmm. And um, I agree that the societies are definitely playing a really significant role there. And I think that, um, that what John mentioned too about how um, if you're trained as a researcher in the past, no one really ever talked to you about <laughs> communicating your science to the public, at least not from my experience. It was more about communicating your science to other researchers. 
Um, but now that it's so critical that the public have access to this information, um, I think it's really incumbent on, on more people to try to do some of this work to translate um, their research or work to um, into a form that can be consumed by the public. And again, if you're not good at it yourself, there are uh, uh, other resources, the societies, centers, etc. cetera, uh, maybe even on your own campus, people who can work with you to help you to do some of that work. Okay, so now turning to questions. Um, we've got a question about um, academic honesty um, as it relates to STEM and also um, programs that help students understand that copying online solutions <laughs> is an ethics violation. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, we're, we've been talking about ethics in STEM, um, but ethics among STEM students and students more in general, um, more broadly um, in terms of, of their academic work is is also a piece of it as well so does anyone want to share um what let's see what was the question specifically programs that work in helping students understand um, that copying online solutions is an ethics violation um any is that incorporated into any of your uh, like the white hat yeah and like in my, in my courses i always leave the students sign an agreement on the first day of class and they don't show up on the first day, whatever their first day is, and they attend the classes, <laughs> um, that they will not copy homework assignments, not use the internet for their programming solutions. And if they see someone doing it, they'll let me know. Um, I explained to them also on the first day how computer science, it's such a competitive field that, you know, when they write something, they should always comment their code too, because writing their actual code is like writing an actual article and that, you know, it's, it might not get published because it's a homework assignment, but in the real world, it would be. So everything needs to be commented and it's their own work. And eventually, if they give assignments out to their friends, they're actually going to potentially possibly give away a job to, to their friend because, you know, they, they just gave them solutions that they worked hard on. So, so, but. <laughs> so making them aware that, them that this aware. is not okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, that by giving it away, it's a problem as well as by taking it, mm -hmm. and that there are implications, or okay. potential implications of doing this, um, maybe not only in the short term, but even in the longer term exactly. in terms of their career. I know like within our university, we, I'm sure all of you use the same thing. We would turn it in for our, our other program, um, for, for any type of written assignments, we have turned it in. And we have a, a really big um, plagiarism um, policy and a code of conduct that our university follows. And I'm assuming that the rest of the universities have the same thing. <laughs> okay. I think most schools have some kind of honor code. Mm -hmm. Certainly mm -hmm. we do. And students sign it, and I think they believe in it. But I also think it's become much more complicated mm -hmm. to figure out what is fair use, what is not fair use, what source can you cite, how do you cite sources. Um, you don't no longer walk into the library and pull a old journal off the stacks, Xerox it, and, you know, take, right? It's so easy to cut and paste, to have rough drafts, to do all kinds of things that students are coming up, they're making problems that we didn't even foresee. And there's so many different ways to cheat or <laughs> share or whatever word you want to use that it's the, the um, goalpost keeps changing almost certainly by semester by semester, there are new things that we see that we're, that's not the right way to do it. That's not your own work, but it's harder to explain why or how. If you, we also encourage collaborative work, and that's a very big question when students mm -hmm. are able to do an experiment together and science is a collaborative endeavor, and you work and want mm -hmm. them to understand collegiality and sharing of expertise, and you're good at pipetting and you're good at dissecting, let's get together and do something amazing. Um, how do you then write it up that shows your own thinking? Which parts is it okay for you to have uh, the same method section, for instance, if you do the work together? It's really tricky and it can be hard for me to explain to a student, much less figure out a penalty or a, either a carrot or a stick to encourage them. This is another place where it's just gotten very, very complicated, but it's certainly worth having a conversation. And we push it hard at the college. We also have students who get in trouble in all kinds of ways. Um, it's just uh, another interesting area where science and ethics combine. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, just to sort of piggyback. Um, oh. no, I'm sorry. Uh, just that at BU, we have three iterative uh, programs. One is that um, for some of the schools, uh, during their orientation, they have a presentation very clearly on what defines plagiarism uh, and, what's a, and how, so how to appropriately cite uh, references. And then many of the schools also have professionalism courses that are required where again definitions of plagiarism are reviewed. Um, and then thirdly in the RCR program that I, I uh, run we also go over uh, cases and uh, examples of plagiarism. And I must say that this is just to reiterate what was said earlier this is very challenging now I think with students who have been brought up with social media where boundaries and uh, sharing, uh, they have much different notions of this than I think we had when we were trained. So it's particularly challenging in this era. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so um, kind of just following up on, on what you both just said, um, my approach is, is it, obviously it's different with different kinds of courses um, and different contexts. Um, but trying to maintain that as an ongoing conversation. So it's not just a, we're showing you these things. So like you're saying, you're iteratively um, in, involving the students in, in understanding why these are this, the types of, different types of behavior may be problematic. Um, and um, so, you know, giving, giving students an opportunity, right? So if you're using some kind of plagiarism detection software giving them the opportunity to take that back and revise right so this is so that there's not uh we're bringing you straight to the dean you know kind of approach and this is like a learning moment um and 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 then with my um, research students in that course you know having those conversations on an ongoing basis about who's doing what work and who's getting credit for it and how how we're allocating sort of authorship and, and uh, information has really been an ongoing struggle that we've had um, and then I think not that to say that I've had definite solutions but just to ha be able to have those conversations I think and you know giving students uh, uh, approaches and ways to maybe correct um, correct course you know throughout the semester uh, I think that has been really um, for me anyway it's been transformative to see them approach these kind of really tangled, um, difficult topics. Oh, we are also using uh, self-assessment of and and peer assessment tools. So rubrics on teamwork. We've been using the value rubrics from the AAC and U. Um, they have ones that assess teamwork, and I think that that gives them an opportunity to say, "This is what I've contributed, and this is where I feel others aren't contributing." And so give them voice in that as part of the grading. Okay, great. Alexa, did you have something? Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, similarly to what other people said, we have is uh, I tell them in my term paper, especially that most of our most of my classes need they have a, a scientific term paper to write that their paper will go th uh, through a um, plagiarism software that will detect you know similarity of things. So they're aware of it, and I give them. Um, usually two or three tries to do it. So like the first time they enter their, uh, their paper, they will see where uh, similarity is and they can kind of uh, rewrite this paragraph. Um, another thing is that when we are doing group projects, I ask at the end of the, of the project that each member of the group rate the effort of the other members and this is individually. So, and then I compare um, what, you know, what the percentage is. And if I see a big uh, discrepancy, then I will uh, talk to the group. And uh, it's funny that um, the way they, um, they feel that they're, they're sharing effort is, is different uh, from, you know, uh, within the, the group. And thirdly, I want to say that I've had experience in, um, like concept of plagiarism between American students and uh, international students. Uh, a lot of uh, international students, um, not European, but from other countries, they feel that um, it's no big deal to, to copy and paste. They don't, uh, or copyright, they don't have sense of what copyright uh, means. 
and um, th this is how they were brought up, you know, in their education system. So it's been challenging to explain to them, especially that uh, you, most of them come as a graduate student. So for uh, our, in our undergrad, they go through orientation and they're explained exactly uh, what is the honor code and the expectation for their behavior. When they come as a uh, graduate students, um, we found that we need to go through the same routine and explain to them because they did not have that uh, same level of um, uh, ethical code that we, we are expecting from our students. Well, thank you, Alexa. You really raise an important issue, which is cultural differences and understanding of what it means to be ethical. Um, some cultures may even um, see copying someone else's work of, as being a way of honoring them and in, in their work. And so we really have to be very clear with how we're defining ethics, um, particularly when it comes to um, the kind of work that we're talking about, uh, plagiarism, et cetera, um, and um, not assume that everyone has the same understanding of those things as we do, and also giving very clear guidelines for how things will be reviewed, and then also possibly giving them another chance because there could have been some misunderstanding and not as necessarily assuming that it was um, deliberate um, ethical violation on their part. So thank you all so much for that discussion. So we're, we're reach, uh, we have reached the last part of our conversation, which is our closing thoughts. And what I would like to do is to um, go back down our agenda list and ask those presenters who are still with us to um, just in a minute or so, a minute or two, share with us what you see as being next for ethics in STEM. Uh, what topics should we be looking at? What's coming down the pike that we really need to be prepared for that maybe we haven't already discussed? Is there something that we can do as the Claire Booth Luce community or as an academic community to, um, to, to be ready for what's coming next? Even if it's a conversation that we need to have that maybe we haven't, um, excuse me, that we haven't mentioned yet in this convening. So I know that Maggie is no longer on the call with us, perhaps John can get us started off. John, are you still with us? John Lepker? Yeah, um, I still am. Okay, great. Okay, in, in the 30 seconds I've thought about this, these are my initial thoughts. So maybe those, <laughs> okay. are, the, maybe those are the most important ones, so the ones coming right to my brain. But um, at least for graduate students, um, I think we, we being the educators in the room need to, encourage and challenge students to think about what are the most pressing ethical issues in their discipline and we need to provide them with the mentorship uh, to enable these discussions to happen i think they need to contemplate this but also they need to be given opportunities to de develop confidence around being leaders in in their field even even at an early stage and they need to be given the space in which to talk about this because they're the next generation of scientists and engineers and mathematicians and we can't wait for them to become associate professors or full professors feel at that point they need to have a voice. These, the, these students who are the next generation need to take on that voice early and they need to take it on often. Um, if not, we're really not gonna make progress um, in a lot of really challenging areas that we're seeing. Great, thank you so much, John. Okay, uh, is Deborah Matthews still with us? Deborah, are you still on the call? Yes, I am here, although I am afraid I was gone for about an hour at another um, meeting. I just came back up again um, about 10 minutes ago. Uh, so also in the 30 seconds that I've thought about this, uh, plus during the last comments, I'll, I'll, first I'll second the, the comments that the prior speaker made. And just to compliment that, I think it's really important not only to give them the space to to do the to you know have these initial conversations but also to practice. I mean the more times you have said something out loud like 
I find that concerning. Here are the reasons I find that concerning. Here's how we should start thinking about this. And just practice using those, coming up with and using those words, I think is really important. And then the one thing, uh, separate uh, issue that I'll add is that, and lots of folks who spoke talked about interdisciplinary conversations. Um, and I think that's critically important. We, there is a huge amount, I'm sure, as you all know, <laughs> of siloing in academia. And it happens not just in academia, but also in policy making. And so, you know, I think of each new emerging technology as a new opportunity to get the governance thing right. Uh, and there's often not enough learning happening between different um, areas of science because we're just not talking to each other. So whatever we can to, do to sort of break down those silos and talk about ethical issues across disciplines more generally, I think would be beneficial. Great. Thank you so much, Deborah. Alan, are you still with us? Yes, I am. So here's my uh, initial 30 second thought. So um, apart from topics, uh, one thing that um, I think would be really useful and very challenging would be to figure out ways to assess the effectiveness of, of the various kinds of um, interventions and tools that are developed to enhance research eth ethical behavior and research. Uh, I think that would be for it to be done, you know, in an empirical manner to really determine what's effective. Uh, we, we're all of us are in charge of all these programs, but still very difficult to assess. And I'm not even sure how we would assess the impact of these interventions. That's a really important point, and I know this one that's been uh, brought up earlier today as well. So thank you for that, Alan. Okay, and let's see. Are Eric and Don still on the call? I think that they had to leave. Eric and Don? Eric or Don? Okay, yeah, I'm pretty sure that they weren't able to stay on the call with us. Okay, so um, Alexa. Um, what are your last thoughts with respect to what's next for STEM ethics? Sure. So I concur with all the presenters that uh, they have already shared their thoughts. I would add, um, uh, we as educators, we need to emulate ethical behavior. So when I, uh, I heard one of the presenters talking about uh, a faculty who um, misrepresent data and there were you know so many publications that they have to be um, uh, retracted and all that um, we need to make sure that we we are um, uh, working in a ethical setting ourselves and also i would like to uh, to encourage uh, other STEM ethics uh, faculty and and uh, and people to uh, disseminate notion to non-STEM uh, students and population. It's very important to uh, to disseminate our information. And interdisciplinary is is definitely one of the key element uh, in in academia to uh, to you know talk about ethical issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexa. Rachel, last thoughts? Um, I would say that I think ways to get students into discussing the ethics is to show them how excited I am about talking about <laughs> the ethics. The same way that you can get, um, scientists tend to get into science because they're wildly excited about answering some kind of question. We find beauty in what we do, whether we're looking through a microscope or measuring something with a spectrophotometer or whatever it would be. It, the challenge of going after questions and finding knowledge is what tends to drive us. Mm -hmm. And to limit that to only your narrow field of cell migration and early embryos or something, <laughs> um, it's just, that's antithetical to sort of how you got into science in the first place. So you modeling ethical behavior, as others have said, modeling all of these, talking to as wide a diverse population as you can, but also these questions of the ethics and intersection with science are juicy, they're scary, they're intricate, they're amazing. 
and we should all be willing to dive in and it should just be part of what everyone does because that's what gets you going in the first place. Great, thank you so much. Joan and Gina. Yes, sure, so again, um, in agreement with what everyone else was saying, um, I'm partial to topics too, uh, of, you know, being with my discipline. Um, I think that a lot can be said moving forward in the future with artificial intelligence and robotics and data science within, um, within the scope of ethics. I think um, educating at a young age about ethics and trying to make it fun and using real world examples is a, is a really good way to get people um, more on board with ethics and STEM. Thank you. So um, I, I like the idea of this being the job of the scientists, the technologists, the engineers. This is part of our job. Um, I'm a chemist by training and chemistry has a, um, has a focus or emphasis on putting safety first and using safety as a design principle. Um, so I think I'm thinking about how to use uh, ethics as a design principle from the beginning, right? And so it's not an add-on, it's not tacked on, it's, and it, so it feels real and integral to the material when it's not the sole topic of discussion in the class. Um, and I'm thinking about ways in which I can empower um, and engage my students I'm thinking about the, what um, our colleagues have said here um, to to let to follow their lead, right? So to 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 let them drive the conversation. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all so much for sharing those last thoughts, and also thank you um, to our presenters for participating as presenters today. Thank you to all of you who are um, participating um, uh, in terms of. Uh, listening to the conversation and then sharing your questions at the end. Um, again, we believe that this is really an important topic, so important that we're dedica dedicating our 30th anniversary celebration to it. And um, uh, thank you for joining us for this convening, but this is not the end of this conversation for the foundation. We're gonna be continuing this conversation with our blog. Um, and hopefully that first blog post will be uh, put out sometime this week. And at least a couple of times a month, um, going forward. I believe that everyone participating on our um, uh, convening today is um, from one of our Claire Booth Luce program institutions and every institution has received the um, information about submitting guest blogs. So if this stimulated something um, in terms of an interest in writing a blog post for us, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you and, and talk about your idea for a blog post and um, Again, uh, we really appreciate your taking the time. We think this is such an important topic um, that we wanted to get um, this information out to everyone um, to enable you to think about um, the ways that other institutions are addressing these issues and maybe even um, help you to think about how some of, the, some of this work can be done on your own campuses, but also in terms of reaching out to the public, to the next generations of scientists, to your students, um, and to your coworkers, your, your fellow faculty members, and your um, institutional leaders as well on your campuses. So thank you again for participating. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.